And first of all, I want to thank uh, Al Amen, the best manager in the world. Hundred and seventh edition of the Boxing Asylum Not House podcast, brought to you by Boxasylum dot com. Happy New Year to all our listeners and uh, all our callers, Twitter, Twitter followers. This is your host Andy Patterson back in the hot seat. With me today, I've got Alex <laughs> Morris, Donny Baseball, Steve Wellens, Kyle McLaughlin, and Kurt Ward. Guys, happy New Year to you. How he's all doing? Yep, good. Thanks. Good. Yeah, brilliant. Happy New Year. He's all sounding kind of depressed here, man. I know it's January and all that, you know. I know we've got no money and we're all fucking skint, but come on. How are Happy you, Andy? Yeah. I know we're slightly depressed after what happened last year and stuff, you know, shit fights and shit moments and stuff, poor pay per view shows and stuff, not getting the fights we wanted, the big fights falling through and all that. What's not to be optimistic about? It's 2015. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. A bit of optimism from Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Donny, I know you're only with us very briefly, mate, so I think you may have to pop off, but what we'll do is, I had hoped to start with the Rigondo fight, but what we'll do is we'll just jump onto the, the Friday night action from New York, uh, the, the car was on um, on Fox Sports, Dusty Har- uh, Harrison against Tommy Rayon and Chris Van Herden, Sales, uh, Sales McCalla and Tereno Johnson, mate, you want to fire through just what happened through that car, please? Uh, well, it's just a couple of, didn't see... Um didn't see, didn't see some of the fights uh, switch back and forth between that and the ESPN card, but uh, but generally uh, Toriano Johnson looked at excellent, um, and he's a solid fighter. I mean, you know, the only uh, loss he has, I believe, is uh, the one to Curtis Stevens, uh, which of course is highly disputed because he was winning that fight on every single scorecard and uh, got um, basically the bad end of a really really late last round uh, stoppage uh, after having taken. A lot of punishment earlier in the fight. I mean, he's a come-forward, aggressive fighter. Um, but matched against, uh, I forget what his opponent's name was, but matched against someone uh, who, you know, couldn't deal with that style very well. I mean, he looks sensational. And um, I think that, that that Curtis Stevens rematch looks really good. I think uh, he, um, you know, did John- Johnson, maybe actually he has uh, expressed interest in taking on Golovkin. And I'll tell you the truth, he can take a really, really good shot. I mean, he took some huge bombs from Curtis Stevens, uh, I was at that fight, uh, covered it for the asylum back in April, uh, and uh, that would be interesting to see. I mean, he's a come forward fighter. I mean, it basically it would be like a like a Golovkin Kirkland, I think, uh, guy who can really hit, a guy who could really well actually Kirkland really can't take a punch, but but Johnson can. So I'd actually like to see that fight if Golovkin's going to stay stick around a middleweight. Uh, and then uh, to the main event, Dusty Hernandez Harrison, uh, you know, faced a really wily veteran uh, named Tommy Raynone, a southpaw. Uh, who had never been stopped, uh, really can take a punch, really knows how to roll with punches. He doesn't get hit cleanly very much, 
Uh, and uh, Hernandez Harrison, I mean, he just outworked him, basically, uh, and he used his uh, long reach to control the fight. Um, had some good stretches, I believe, in the seventh round. Uh, he had Renown up against the ropes and uh, was hammering him to the body and to the head and, and unleashing some combinations. But in general, um, he never really had him in trouble. Uh, it's one of those fights where it's like when you're headlining in Madison Square Garden, I think you want to put him in with somebody who against whom he's going to look good, um, but at the same time make it a step up. And that was the big criticism with Hernandez Harrison is that he didn't hasn't stepped up before. Uh, he is 24-0 or 25-0 now, and uh, but the I, mean, I don't know if anyone remembers, but on a Friday Night Fights card, I think it was last year, Teddy Atlas said that basically he basically accused him of being like a um, a Deontay Wilder type, uh, having no really significant opposition, being matched very soft. But it's also important to remember that Hernandez Harrison turned pro uh, basically the day after his 17th birthday, so. Uh, he is very young still. I think he's only 19 now. Uh, and, um, I mean, he does look promising, but he's still raw, and he needs more fights against against significant opposition. But in general, um, he didn't completely stink the joint out. Uh, there were some good – there was a lot of knockouts earlier on the card. You have to think the crowd uh, was okay with that then with the card generally. But, but I mean, he needs, he needs to get uh, some more seasoning. But um, – it wasn't a bad debut for Rock Nation there. Uh, they they put on a good card, and uh, I think expect more good things for them to come with Andre Ward and all that stuff. So that's, that's what I have to say about that card. One thing, uh, Donnie, was especially after the, the Stevens defeat, actually, I know some people were, were, well, maybe they were complaining, actually, about the fact that the Stevens fight was stopped too soon. Maybe he deserved the chance to kind of keep fighting. Um, give me your thoughts on his activity, actually, since that fight, because I think he's fought, what, four or five times now since that fight. And they, on Tommy Ray Renone, actually, actually, I speak to the guy on Twitter quite often. I just want to kind of read out one of his comments here, actually, from this morning. He says, Dusty took away my straight left hand, which is vital to my offense. He also wasn't throwing a straight right hand, which I was waiting for on the counter with my left uppercut to the liver, which is a humbling shot when I land at flush. The kind of shot I would only have got, got in once or twice to have my upper, um, sorry, to have my opponent second guessing and being tentative. I take it was uh, was Harrison very very wary? Was he very kind of like more kind of box with the back foot slightly? Um, no, I mean, well, yeah, at first he was, and later on he came forward. But um, I mean, Renon, in my opinion, I mean. Like, he's one of those guys, he's kind of like a Kingpin Johnson. He's not going to make for an exciting fight, and he's going to take your guy rounds. He's never been stopped, but he also can't punch. I think he has, like, four KOs and 22 or something like that, uh, 22 wins. Uh, I mean, you know, he, he's going to take your guy rounds, and he's also going to pre- present stylistic challenges that when you have a young prospect that you're trying to bring along, uh, you know, being a southpaw, being somebody that rolls with punches very well, doesn't get hit cleanly, It'll test them, and it'll you know see if they can deal with a lot of different nuances that they're going to see as they progress in their careers with with more elite opponents. Basically, people who are kind of like Tommy Raynon, except they can punch, and uh, they also you know I mean they you know basically do what he does at a higher level. Uh, so I mean he's he, like I said he's a good he's a good fight to put a young prospect in with because because uh, he will test him. Uh, but I mean in general, uh, I mean he didn't. I, I don't think Tommy Raynone is going to be making anybody think twice. I don't care where the hell he hits him. Uh, I mean, he's he's not a puncher. He's only, I mean, four KOs and 22 wins. I mean, uh, he says he, he's going to make people think twice before coming in by landing his left hook to the liver. I mean, he hasn't stopped people since, like, early in his career, probably when he was fighting, like, you know, pro debut type guys. So, um, no, I mean, I just think I just think Hernandez Harrison struggled with him a little bit. But then again, so does everybody. Nobody looks good against him, but it is a good way to bring a guy along. Moving on, uh, I think also from, I'm trying to remember where this fight was from, uh, it was from California. Kyle, mate, um, you've again, Kriartov, we spoke over the course of the, the Christmas period, actually, as to how far this kid could go, actually. You're very impressed. Third round knockout against Maurice, is it Lushum? How did they look, mate? Uh, I'll be honest with you, it took him a few, he, he tends to blow people out pretty quickly. Um, once he got his timing down and <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, basically, he, he slipped a jab to the outside, fired back right hand, smashed this kid's mouth guard out. It was it was brutal. He, he really is a really hard puncher. Quite short arms, um, so he has to work his way in. But he's obviously got that amateur pedigree. Um, uh, 
people who aren't aware of him might remember that he got robbed against a go-go in the Olympics. But he's a monster puncher. The, the stoppage in the end, it was one of those standing on the feet, one clean shot landed after a barrage, and they kind of called it off. Uh, but he looks he looks phenomenal. Uh, he had a bit of a problem when he first came onto the pros. Off. He was fighting in, like, random clubs and stuff, and I don't really think that he was... Um, in, in, in the best place training wise he seemed to have ditched a lot of what made him good in the first place he just turned into a bit of a brawler but he's back on it now and, and I, I think he's going to go all the way to be honest with you of course he's saying with, with Lou DeBella now I mean obviously what's that now he's what 8-0 I think Is it, you know I think it's time that we step up in class maybe move up to regional title level well, yeah, I mean, he's, the guys that he is fighting, they're not exactly, they're not exactly, I hate to call anyone bums, but they're not all losing record types. He's, he's, he's fought a couple of decent, uh, you know, kind of regional level fighters as it is, or, or at least, you know, good club fighter level in terms of, they might be undefeated, but they're still pretty good fighters. And and he's and he's disposed of them all. I mean, to be honest with you, he's one of those guys that I'd move up already. Uh, we already talked about guys like Curtis Stevens and that. I think in a couple of fights, if, if, He'd be ready for that level of middleweight, really. I, I wouldn't hold him back at all. I think it's just going to be a good addition, actually, to the middleweight division, actually, because I think it's really starting to thin out. So is super middleweight slightly. So I think if I think it was over the weight fight, actually, but either either way, I like to see him, you know, continue at middleweight. Uh, obviously, going to be a good addition to the weight. Donny, mate. Um, again, briefly, I think you caught a part of the, the other what other fight. What was his name? Dali Perez. Yeah, I know yeah. you only watched parts of it, but uh, you said it was kind of like one-way traffic. Uh, not early on. Um, Atlas seemed to be giving a lot of rounds uh, to Perez early, early from the start. I actually think I had an even fight through about four rounds, um, something like that, or maybe it was 3-2 uh, for Perez. But then all of a sudden Perez took over. I mean, uh, Marcelo uh, is kind of like a um, – well, he's like – he kind of has all the same flaws that I think Amir Khan used to have. Uh, where he jumps in a lot with his chin up, um, and he gets caught. Uh, he moves straight back. He moves back at straight lines, uh, and you know he was on the receiving end of a lot of punches. I mean, the guy actually, again, in another parallel, he has great hand speed, very, very good hand speed, but um, but he doesn't know how to harness that, and uh, and he got continually timed and continually countered by Darlis Perez, and uh, and eventually, after uh, some fielding out rounds early on, after Perez adjusted to the speed. Uh, that was all she wrote. Um, so, yeah, I guess uh, Perez is a new uh, WBA interim champion. Uh, God knows how many champions they have in that weight class. I'm not even going to pretend to know. Uh, but um, Perez looked good. I mean, uh, Perez's only loss, I believe, was to uh, Yuriarki uh, Gamboa up in Canada last year, I think. But other than that, you know, and he's a, he's a really good fighter. So, you know, there's no shame in losing to him. But um, but other than that, you know, I mean, uh, Perez uh, could be a contender at lightweight. I mean, he's a titleist now, obviously, and uh, brings something to the table. So uh, it's too bad uh, Crawford wasn't sticking around. It might be interesting. Um, you know, another good counterpuncher. But, I mean, otherwise, uh, I mean, yeah, that was not, not nothing to write home about. So that's all the action from this weekend. Says uh, says January, January, kind of quiet month. But what we'll do is we'll just uh, rewind back in time to 2014 from Osaka, Japan, on 31st of well, New Year's Eve. Actually, uh, Guillermo Rigondo against Hishi or H- Hishashi Yamagasha. Um, to be honest, some people will say as you know, Rigondo didn't look his best. Some you know he did survive a scare, but at times I, I felt that you know Rigondo. Pretty much dominated the fight, actually. Um, even though he, he, got, I think he got dropped twice in the sixth round, I thought he was hurt with the second one, actually. But it was the way he responded when he came out in the seventh round. I said to myself, "Well, okay, that's that's the way a champion should be responding, rather than just kind of sit on the sit on the back foot." Kyle, I know you were slightly, well, I didn't say pissed off, but probably slightly annoyed. I think he actually had Yamagasha going at one point. I think it was maybe around the middle part of the fight. He realised it wasn't going to kind of basically blow him out, so he took a step back. You think he maybe should maybe have stepped in there and maybe try and blast him out? Well, I think in the end it turned out that Amagasa was extremely tough. Maybe Rigondeau did make the the right decision not stepping in, but um, I'm with you. It was the seventh round, I believe, the knockdown. So I definitely think the second knockdown did hurt uh, Rigondeau and. Abagasa really for me he was big he was awkward but he was sloppy I don't really think there was much about him really and um, you know he, he was tough he was world class in terms of his toughness 
In terms of his skill level, he was sloppy, I think, and a lot of Rigo apologists out there are saying, oh, well, you know, you know, if you get it, you get it, and uh, Amagasa really, even though he was huge, he shouldn't be hitting a fighter of Rigo's level. He did, uh, Maroquin, he knocked, he hurt Rigondale as well, and I do think, as talented as he is, sometime soon someone's going to crack him, and it doesn't need to be someone who hits as hard as uh, Donair. Kurt, me, I think there was one thing. Donny, I know you and I have been arguing back in the past. You, you know, you're a big Donair nut hugger. Um, I've always been inside of Rigondo. I've been champion for that Donair fight for the well, time when Rigondo was five and zero. Um, since that, since that, that win, actually, you always say that you should maybe go up and maybe get the bigger fight there, up at featherweight. And I know you never saw the fight, but Kurt, I think that fight basically proves that Rigondo, if at anything does not belong up at featherweight because that, although that guy was coming down he was massive for the weight absolutely huge but uh, I think that just kind of proves that the guy should either be fighting at A either bantamweight or definitely super bantamweight yeah, well, I think it's fairly obvious uh, Rigo can fight at bantamweight I mean he, he's a small guy you can see that and I think if he moves up he's he's going to face a lot tougher task than what he saw against uh, on New Year's Eve against a guy who like Carl said you know was was big and strong but wasn't really that good I, I mean I, I think I'll give him the benefit of doubt and say you know he, he expected another easy fight like he got last time out in um, Macau was it and you know maybe he took this guy a bit lightly and you know once this guy had him down and hurt you know he, he just really put a beating on him at the end to be honest but the first I think seven rounds are pretty much routine rig and uh, fight a bit like Floyd fights every round's pretty much the same and then you know once once he got hurt that's when he really stepped on the gas and there was a lot of action and you know, if fair play to this, this this opponent, you know, he could take a shot and that was make it, you know, more entertaining because Rigo had to keep hitting him back because he was just kept coming forward. But yeah, I think Rigo should stay where he is or move down. I mean, I don't think he will move down, but he'll stay where he is. And you know, the talk of the fights against some of the big guys at featherweight, I just I just think you know, at this age now, you got to remember, even though he hasn't been a pro for that long, what is he now? He's getting on in age, especially for a small guy. Alex, I, got, I said it right after the fight, actually. Um, I don't know if it was just me, but I think Rigo is now on the slide. Um, I don't think his foot <coughs> movement was exactly how we've seen it in the past. I thought he was slightly more kind of stand in the, in the pocket, more relying on upper body movement. And at times, he was illegally, you know, basically bending down over past the uh, Amagashi's waist, which is illegal. Um, as I say, I, I think maybe slightly on, on the slide. Maybe I don't know if it's maybe... I don't know, jet lag or whatever it is, maybe he didn't take the guy seriously enough, who knows, but my personal opinion is he's on the slide. What do you think? Uh, personally, I think he just didn't take him seriously. I mean, we saw what he was doing. He was just mecking about at times. Like I said, he was a bit slower than usual, uh, all that bending down and moving around. I think he just did that because it's easier than running away, I guess. But um, I don't think he's particularly on the slide. He might be because, I mean, how old is he? His age is a bloody mystery. He looks about 60 old, sixty odd, so, you know, you don't know what's gonna, what he's doing and when he's going to reach that sort of uh, peak of his and then just sharply decline. But um, I do think that he, he does definitely doesn't belong at the higher weights. I mean, he, the, the frame on him, you think that he could probably make super flyweight. It's ridiculous the way he probably could boil down, but he's being forced into uh, going for these higher weights because that's where the money is. There's no money at bantamweight. You know, the, money's, uh, the money barrier seems to stop uh, super bantamweight upwards. And he sees that featherweight, there's loads of these guys. There's Lomachenko, there's Walters, you know, uh, there's Gradovich. All these guys could probably earn him a lot more money than fighting a lot of the guys at Super Bantamweight at the moment. Uh, he's tried to fight the guys at Super Bantamweight, and obviously they're not, they're not interested. But maybe the Amagasa fight will change that. Maybe they will see that, oh, this guy could catch him. This guy, you know, for all his flaws and for how average Amagasa is, he managed to clock Regan Day with at least two punches that put him down. Maybe I can do that. Maybe Scott Quigg is thinking that. Maybe Carl Frampton's thinking that. And maybe that's that's the benefit for all of us. Maybe maybe you know we could eventually see these fights because they've seen a weakness in him. I think that Regan Day, you know, he, he's obviously incredibly naturally talented. He's incredibly skilled. And I think that in some fights, he feels that his natural talent can probably get him through it a lot better than having to put all of the effort in. You know, he's been dropped and hurt and made look a bit, you know, sloppy against really sort of inferior fighters fighters before. But then against Donaire, who's coming off of, you know, fighter of the year honours, 
he just goes out and you know puts on the performance of the year and absolutely schools him. I think that given the right opponent and given the right opportunity, I think he will step up to the mark and put on a masterclass. But maybe now that we've seen some weaknesses in him, we'll actually see those fights materialize. My hypothesis is that Rigo tanked in his most recent fight just to make himself look vulnerable so someone will actually fight him. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But uh, <laughs> Kyle, mate, I was going to ask me, obviously, I mean, people look at the knockdown, uh, I think the first knockdown, anyway, I think it was more to do with the fighters, I think Yamagashi came in with a punch, Rigo then slipped it or rolled underneath, and then so for some amazing reason, Yamagashi just seemed to turn like a cat and catch him with a right hand and dropped him. But... She, uh, this is my question to you, actually, is the way he celebrated, he actually deserved to have a face like a bag of spanners after that fight, didn't he? Because he didn't, he didn't even <laughs> fight getting dropped off that. No, 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 near as bad as, I don't remember the middleweight from a few uh, years back from Japan, Kuji Sato. He um, did some weird kind of dance in, in the ring just from knocking down some journeymen. That was uh, that was embarrassing. But um, I think Amagasa seems like a good kid to me, and I can imagine him, you know, he's, he's completely out of his depth, he's never fought on this level, he's probably had a horrible weight cut, and you know, he's dropped one of the best fighters in the world, and it looked pretty heavy, but as I said, I don't know if I've said to you before guys, but I thought the second knockdown, those arm punches, didn't look nothing on him, and they hurt Rigon down yeah, badly, looked, so, yeah, there, yeah. Uh, I, I think that, um, you know, I guess, you know he's, he's probably on top of the world, we probably need to put ourselves in his shoes and realise that if we just knock Rick and down when he's beating the, you know, beating the shit out of us, then we'd probably be quite happy as well, do you know what I mean? So, I thought he did alright, I, I think really done so well because he exceeded our expectations and I think for the first few rounds, he was trying to set his work up, he wasn't that terrible, but he really, world class toughness only, certainly not world class in any other facet of the game uh, the knockdown I think the first one Rigon Dow did his usual thing where he tries to turn all the way around his opponent if he hadn't done that I yeah. think the shot would have went over his shoulder he turned around so much that the shot hit him he kind of walked him he walked himself into the shot whilst walking away it was kind of weird he spun himself into the shot it was weird really but oh well it happens I, I definitely think Rigo's got a bit of a dodgy chin not a terrible one good powers of recovery but as I said That's before what I was it, just going to ask yeah. do you think that he's got a bad chin because his recovery powers do seem excellent I mean we've seen like the likes of Marquez he gets dropped a lot but he's straight back up in seconds ready to give it another go <laughs> Yeah, but Marquez won't really drop by sort of journeyman level fighters. Oh, not journeyman, fringe level contenders, shall yeah, we say. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It reminds me a bit of Steve Cunningham in the fact that he gets dropped quite a few times, but he seems to recover pretty well. That's a good show. Or, or, or Kalzaki. Yeah. Kalzaki's got a great chin, yeah. then he gave me it. <laughs> saying, but he, he he had a thing about getting dropped a lot, but he never. I mean, he was no, like he did. Really he comes he got dropped dropped by, and he got and he got dro- dropped by Hopkins Four and Byron Mitchell, didn't he? And he got dropped he, by Kabari Salem as well, didn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, got, he got dropped. He got dropped off Salem, um, Hopkins, Jones, Four times, and Byron Mitchell. Mitchell. Byron Mitchell. Mitchell. Four times in his career. Fucking right, yeah, I mean, been about saying, six times or something. Yeah, but I'm just saying, dropped. Well, has been down three often, times. Not often hurt. That's all. Aaron okay, Pryor, Aaron Pryor might Jesus. be a half decent comparison. No, it wasn't. He was hurt. He was badly hurt. You guys get so fucking defensive about Kalzaki. I just said that the guy. Well, I you shouldn't be trolling us about Kalzaki, man. Don't don't troll us about Kalzaki. That's, that's I don't even like, like Kalzaki, so you know. Uh, Kurt, mate, well, final question before we move on to the undercard fights and, and the other card. Um, with general feeling is that Regal may be on the slide. Okay, some are are, are kind of indicating that he's ready to be taken. Who, in your opinion, is there available and can actually beat him? No one at the weight, in my opinion. It's if he moves up and when he faces the bigger guys, if he w- did got to move up. But I still think guys like Frampton, Quig, they're not good enough to beat him. I mean, maybe they can get in a... Frampton can hurt him, maybe, but I, I just can't see it myself. I still think he's he's going to be way too good. Kyle? Oh, do you know what? I think Cole Frampton would give him a good go. And everyone think, probably think... Out of all the people to say this, it wouldn't be me. But I actually do think Carl Frampton would give him a good go. He's, he's quite quick. He's got short arms, which is an issue because Rigo will be able to dictate the pace against him. But Carl Frampton, he, he, he's got quite a few punches in the book. He's quite quick. He's defensively aware. He's not slick, but you know he's, he's, he seems pretty tough. And I don't know. I think he can give Rigo a few different looks. If he can make him come forward, maybe make Rigo come forward and he can play the counter puncher. I don't know. I'm not going to say outright he's going to beat him. Um, I prefer to see Rigo down at bantamweight like all you guys fighting the likes of Yamanaka and, and those kind of guys. But mm. I don't know. I think Scott Quigg would get slaughtered badly. But I think Carl Frampton would give him a pretty good go, to be honest with you. 
I think so as well. Steve, I'll bring you in here, mate. I've, I've been hearing some words coming out that potentially within the next couple of fights, Frampton then says he might be ready to take on Regon, though. Have you heard similar? Well, yeah, we've heard that. I've heard it a few times. I think Kyle's right that Frampton would give uh, Rigo the most trouble of anybody at the weight, but I don't think anybody at the weight beats him. You know, Rigondo is going to have to move up to featherweight and whatever in the likes of Lomachenko, Nicholas Walters. I think he's in, you know, he's banging, not in trouble, but that they're proper fights. And I mean, the Rigondo, Lomachenko would be a good one, but we're hearing about Frampton going in with him and Rigo's 33 now. If Frampton can get a couple of defences under his belt. Allegedly. And, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I mean, he's supposed to be 33 anyway, but uh, he, is he showing signs of vulnerability? Is Donny right? Is he sort of um, taking his foot off the gas or even purposely trying to goad people into a fight? He needs something, doesn't he, Rigon, though? He's globe-trotting. He needs the big fight. And uh, like I said before, he's in the strange position where he's the number one guy at the weight and everyone can can afford to duck him, but um, I don't see anyone beating him. But, yeah, a few, couple of fights, Frampton, um, hopefully give him a good go. I, I, I think you're right there, Steve. He needs someone, and I think as well as, if, if you compare and contrast, maybe like that Beckel fight, the black statue, he did nothing. Didn't he? Once he felt the power, he wasn't interested. The thing about yeah, Yamagashi is, he kept trying to fight, and he kept trying to win, and that's what made Rigon look actually look a lot more exciting and a lot more better to watch. My personal opinion, so he needs a fighter that's going to kind of basically make him fight, make him think, and make him move. What you're also saying, and I also read, is see, remember the first round, I thought it was kind of weird that, uh, that Rigo just stood there with his, with his hands up, just letting the guy tee off on him. It just wasn't, that's what made me kind of type of, you know, think that maybe his reflexes are no longer at his peak, probably, and, you know, maybe his foot movement isn't, he, what, isn't he what it is. Alex, Donny, do you think anybody at Super Bantamweight is out there can actually beat him just now? No. Nah. No. Nah. Donny? But what's Donny's away? I mean, like the other guys, I think Frampton probably gives him the best go. I think anyone, if they can land a decent punch on him, could put him down. But it's landing enough punches on him to put him down for good. And we've seen the, the best super bantamweight of, you know, two years ago do that. And Rigo got up and broke his fucking cheek. Yeah, you got to remember as well, for a defensive fighter, this guy can also bang pretty hard as well, and you got to be willing to take what he dishes out. You know, this guy thought on New Year's Eve, you know, could take a hell of a punch, and at the end, I mean, his face looked like he'd been in a car wreck. So, I mean, you got to be willing to take that as well, and it's, it's, it's very hard for, I think, a lot of these guys to, to get through to him when he's, you know, so elusive, but also can punch quite hard as well. I think that's the shocking thing about fighting him, is that I think fighters don't expect him to hit that hard, and when they do get hit, they, they sort of do what Agbeko did and just, you know, shell up a bit and realise that, oh God, if I make a mistake, this guy's going to smash my face in. Did Chris, did yeah, Chris Avalos no say that he didn't punch that hard or something? Who, Avalos? I can't uh, what he said. Now, I know that Avalos' manager was adamant both on the mic and off the mic about Rigondo. He said, I've seen Rigondo many a time at ringside and he's vulnerable. He's really vulnerable and someone's going to take him. Now, like Kyle said on the chat, it's, it's, Avalos ain't going to be the man who's going to take him. But he's, you know, a lot of people seem to see this vulnerability in him. But the thing is with Rigondo, he's so adaptable. And people say, oh, he's a master defensively. He can punch hard. He can do a bit of everything. You know, he, mm. he can come forward. He can drop back. He showed against Donair. He just completely nullified Donair for the, for the first seven or eight rounds before Donair even got any kind of a foothold in the fight. He's so adaptable and he's so skillful and just tactically brilliant. And, uh, you know, fighters just don't know what to do with him. I've lost Donny. Donny. Quick point. On you go, mate. Is gone. On you go, Kyle, mate. I was going to say, quick point as well. We're all talking about how, oh, he could cut a few pounds, he could cut a few pounds. One of the reasons he's so good and that his opponents can't keep up with him is that he doesn't cut any weight whatsoever. No, in fact, he doesn't in the cut way. any weight. Yeah, exactly. And he doesn't cut any weight. He's like an old school fighter in that respect. His legs are strong. If they are going going on him a bit in his sort of middle ages, the last thing he wants to be doing, especially you know down at lower weights, even cutting four pounds or so. Do you know what I mean? I'd yeah. love to see him down at band weight fighting Yamanako. I, I hear that he might be fighting in Japan again sometime in April. Well, I suppose it depends on whether Jay Z chucks a load of money at him, but. I hear there is an offer on the table to fight back in Japan again, possibly against uh, Shingo Wake. I'd prefer to see him fight Yamanaka. Even if Yamanaka yeah. comes up four pounds, he ain't going to be no smaller, is he? 
doesn't matter. I mean, I would like to see, even at a catch weight that fight, you know, I mean, it's only a, a couple more pounds, I mean, was it four or five pounds? I, mean, I, don't, I don't really care. I think Yamanaka would fit in at Super Bantam weight, no problem. I think it would be a good fight. You guys got a lot of length. Two south paws as well, so just wonder if the styles might, might gel up. We never, never know. Just going to the undercard now, guys, I think we've all had the same problem trying to catch these fights. I'm a bit disappointed that the Ioka fight didn't come out because I wanted to see if the kid has been improved much. Um, he had a fifth round knockout against Jean Piro Perez, and uh, m- one of the minimum weight guys, one of the top end guys, Kantasura Takayama, he regained the vacant IBF world minimum weight title and, along with the vacant WBO title, which was vacated by Francisco Rodriguez Jr. after their potential fight of the year of 2014 back in August. He beat Go Odare in a seventh round stoppage. Um, Kyle, I know you saw most of the Takayasa Uchiyami fight against Israeli Perez, ninth round retirement. Um, just briefly, mate, give us a rundown of how that fight went. It's quite a weird one, actually, mate, because... Um, He's short, Uchiyama, though, isn't he? Yeah. He, looked, he looked terrible, mate. And there was a few times where he went down. It didn't look like, you know, I'm not going to say he got whacked and he was in br- really bad trouble and the referee protected him. But there's one point where he got hit, I think it was a, a straight right to the body, and he, and he went down, like, sort of fat, fell down on his ass. And the referee didn't count it, and there was a couple more where it looked like he was under pressure. And basically, all he can do now is kind of wait for his opponents to attack him and then just throw back. He can't do, he can't set up his counters anymore. I, don't, I think maybe he's weight drained or maybe he's just passed his best, but eventually he forced a stoppage. The chap didn't come out for the last round, um, but uh, he looked... It's really sad to say because I've liked Uchiyama for years, but he looks like a fighter who's well on his way out. I reckon he's he's there for the taking, really. By any of the, even any of the feather, I think if Walters moved up, he'd destroy him in about three or two or three rounds. On the undercard, Kohei Kono had a twelve round draw against Norberto Jimenez, WBA super flyweight title. Um, now I think this kid actually lost to uh, Inu this uh, Ryoshi Tagayuchi against Alberto Rossell from Peru who was a WBA light flyweight title holder he lost a 12 round decision and uh, I think that's really it for that card so basically now we'll rewind back to the 30th of December which was the Tuesday um, we'll go down the undercard actually starting off with Ryota Murata he had a 10 round unanimous decision against Jesse Nicklow um, I don't know who saw the fight. I remember Kyle saw it. Alex, you maybe seen it as well, mate. Um, still not impressed with this guy. Um, I really don't know. I mean, I noticed he's, he's kind of the top ten at one of the one of the ranking bodies. I didn't see why, but um, I can't see this guy going far. Anybody want to dispute me on that one? It was. Uh, uh, it's been a while now. I'm trying to remember it, but I remember it was a bit of a laboured performance. Uh, you know, he took his time with this guy, and this guy was quite tough, and he was giving it a good go. But um, it wasn't really nothing to shout at him about or write him about. Um, you know, he was just trying to wing in the straight right hand all the time, just trying to burst the guy down by using the same old punches. He wasn't really trying too hard, I don't think, or maybe he was, and he just didn't have the skill set or the ability to break through this guy, guy's sort of high guard. But um, you know, it, it, there was a lot of hype for him, obviously, at the beginning of last year, but not really capitalised on that I don't think uh, Jorge Linares picked up the WBC lightweight title again a fourth round knockout against Javier Prerto um, in all honesty I don't think the guy was actually in his league in all honesty um, so at least that one the better um, Pedro Guevara uh, defeated the former lineal flyweight title sorry lineal world flyweight champion Jakiri Yagashi Seven round stoppage with a left hook to the body. Well, actually, it was an actual liver shot, in all honesty, because uh, your guys he was done for, you could account it to like next Monday, for instance, he would have still been done in all fours because uh, that's a, I could re watch the fight the other night there, guys. Uh, just pile on as to whoever saw it. Um, I think maybe Gonzalez maybe took the prime out of Yagashi. You know, it was a bad beating he took there, but you just don't know if maybe cutting that weight down to like flyweight now is maybe just took that wee extra oomph out of his, out of his, uh, out of his performances. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's going to sound really harsh, but I don't think Yagashi was ever brilliant anyway. He was definitely world class, but um, I think. So- uh, yeah, I think, yeah, definitely. I think the Souza fight really did um, make him look a lot better than he was because people are like, oh, wow, look, he can box a bit as well. He's always been best sort of getting into a scrap, but I think now he's, I mean, this, this Guevara lad looked really good actually, to be honest with you. But I think if he can't wore it up like he used to, 
he's done really at the top level. And yeah, I, I think you're right. Maybe cutting the, the extra pounds might have screwed him over a bit. But I don't see him beating any of the top other flyweights that are around at the moment. I'd, I'd love to see him in with someone like Ruin Rowing or someone like that. I'm that Ruin Wrong or someone like that. But um, yeah, I don't know, man. You see, you see throughout history a lot of the Oriental fighters and the Far Eastern fighters once they lose a couple of fights by stoppage, they don't tend to come back. Some of them retire after their first loss. And Yugashi's had two or the bounce now so I'm not even sure if we'll see him again he looked pretty happy after the fight like in the post press uh, in the in the post fight photos and that but I don't know man I, I don't know if he'll come back or not yeah now new star is born uh, to be honest we've been speaking about this guy on this podcast for well over 18 months I would say um, I watched I watched the tail end of his amateur career I've seen all his pro fights Currently, Nayu Inu, he now becomes a two-weight world title holder, jumped up from late flyweight, dumping his title there to super flyweight, defeated the long-standing WBO champion Omar Narvaez. Some people say, OK, Narvaez is short, he's too old, he's never all that good in all honesty, but this is a kid, uh, basically, in, in the old sense of the word, that is that a kid who's basically in his, what, is his fifth or his sixth pro fight, I think it was. Sorry, his, his eighth pro fight, sorry. Stops him in two rounds, drops him twice, in the first round, I think he dropped him down twice in the second, I think, and he basically got counted out. Is this going to be the next Japanese superstar, do you think? Well, for me, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I voted in Fighter of the Year. I know I think our awards will say differently, which I think is bad, but, you know, it's it's not just who he's beaten, but it's the way he beat him. I mean, Narvaez has had what, almost 30 world title fights. You know, he's two weight champion. He's he's defending his titles over so many years, I think 12 or 13 years, and he's gone in the ring, and you know now people are saying, oh, in hindsight, he looked old and everything, but even if you expected him to lose, you know, to, to be looked like a total, you know, basically a bum in there, to be honest, in your, in your, he made him look like, he just didn't belong in the same arena as him, he just had no respect for him, and just destroyed him, I mean, I know he, 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 he was very defensive when he fought Donaire, but Donaire didn't really know what to do with him. He won the fight easy enough, but he couldn't really, you know, do what he wanted to, which is obviously to to do what Inouye did to him and destroy him. And it was a fantastic performance, I think. And the fact that he's he's young and he's only had, you know, seven, eight pro fights, I just think it's incredible what he's doing, to be honest. Alex, Narvaez um, says that he's that he was well taken back by the power of this kid. I mean, yeah, I mean, body shot wise, this this guy's going to be. I think we'll need to nickname him. If you can't even pronounce his name, I think you need to nickname him the Body Snatcher. He's the monster, isn't he? That's his oh, real what? name, and that's that's suitable enough. I mean, he is an absolute monster. I mean, I don't think any of us predicted that at all. No one, we either think thought that, or maybe he's going to stop him late, or win a wide decision over Navias, or maybe Navias might nick it by you know by boring sort of. Uh, you know, clinching and spoiling and stuff, but no, um, to go right in there and absolutely destroy this guy. I mean, Navias, yeah, maybe he's been on the slide, but absolutely just wipe him out with, you know, every punch that landed seemed to hurt Navias as well. The body punches, as you say, were just winging in and then straight to the head afterwards, taking advantage of every single offensive attack, which is brilliant. And it was fantastic to watch. And this guy needs uh, a lot of focus and a lot of attention from the West because. You know, he, he's a definite star for the future. And it seems that, um, you know, he's moving up. You know, he, he seems good at the weight as well. And there's definitely going to be some super fights, obviously, with uh, Roman Gonzalez or, you know, Juan Estrada as well. So, um, you know, we, people should be paying him attention. And obviously, I, I voted him for my uh, fighter of the year as well. But as Kurt said, our awards will probably end up, uh, will be saying something different. But... Everyone out there, if they haven't seen this kid fight, they should definitely see the fights that he had last year and just keep an eye on him uh, next year. You know, there could have been some nervousness around with him as well, taking this thing on our, this well-established champion, but there's just no mm. respect shown whatsoever. Oh, no, you saw it. As soon as, you know, in his ring walk, he just didn't give a fuck. You saw his face. He was walking out there calm and confident as anything. And he, he did the business. He is the monster. Kale. Well, I've got to say, uh, um, it was it surprised everyone. Um, and Shingo Inoue, who's, who's, his dad, who's training him, he said before the fight, he's getting 
a little bit older. He can't make the weight of life fly out anymore. That's why he had that turgid performance against a tie fella. And when he moves up, he's going to be a lot better. And I, I did believe him. I didn't think he'd be that much better. And um, people were already going crazy saying, oh, he's going to move up the featherweight. And that. at a super flyweight, he looks pretty perfect to me. I can imagine he's probably weighs in the tad over the bantamweight uh, limit. And um, basically, I think that Narvaez is the kind of guy who gets into a real as the fight goes on and when people jump on him early just as uh, Alex alluded to he's quite boring he, he he covers up and he works his way forward gradually and he had to open up a lot earlier and in the second round he started getting a bit closer to uh, to a new A and it was exactly the same as in the Hernandez fight as soon as his opponent got closer to him a new A opened up he took a little step back and allowed Narvaez just to overreach a bit and caught him with that sort of check left hook and dropped him and um, the body shot was just absolutely brutal I, I think he's absolutely brilliant I, I compared him to Ray Ray Leonard on the day, I'm probably a bit over the top, but someone else compared him to uh, Wilfredo Gomez, and I do, I think he looks like Wilfredo Gomez, a bit like Ray Leonard, he's got the offence, he moves around, but he doesn't run away, he's got a mastery of uh, ring generalship, it seems, and I, I like to see him in, even the super fights look good, but I love to see him uh, unify with the WBC champion, uh, Carlos Quadros, he, he's, he's a good fighter, be a good fight, and um, I, I think he's absolutely exceptional, it's just... A case of is he going to burn out quickly, like say Wilfred Benitez, or is he going to keep his head screwed on and you know go to thirty and you know, all title fights against a who's who of the lower weight classes? Um, I think Roman Gonzalez. A lot of people are picking him to smash him, but I think the Gonzalez fight is still a pick and fight. I, I just think in a new way the world's at his feet. I really do think he is one of maybe not top ten pound for pound, but definitely one of the best fighters on the planet at the moment. I kind of disagree with that. No, honestly, mate. I think he's he's got one of these great pro styles. Actually, very aggressive. Um, what I did notice from some of his amateur fights was I think he, he got he got seriously like, pointed against what, a Cuban fighter. I forget his name just now. I didn't think his defence was all up, up to much at that point, but he seems to have done a lot of work on it because he's got a really good D about him now. Donny, I mean, you know, as we, we've alluded to before, is trying. I mean, I don't know if you heard me mention that some of these undercard fights we haven't been able to kind of see them. Um, that being the case, obviously we've got we, we generally believe we've got a superstar in our hands here, or the Japanese certainly believe so, and we actually are backing that up also. How the hell do we get this guy on a mainstream Western television? Well, I think the answer to that is how did Prince Nassim get on? Because before him, I think a lot of the, the lower weight classes, and I'm not talking about the lower lower weight classes, but the lower weight classes generally didn't give get as much attention. Uh, from the uh, American sports media, and Prince Nassim came along and changed all that, and he brought a huge fan base with him uh, that made for some electrifying events. Uh, most you know, memorably, of course, the Kevin Kelly uh, when he made his America debut uh, at Madison Square Garden. So uh, maybe in a way it can bring that same sort of excitement uh, down to sort of the, the lower, lower weights. Um He's an exciting fighter. He uh, is taking on all of the best early in his career. Uh, the only sort of comparison I could make is, you know, running through, and, and it's actually probably even a better level of opposition, but, but you know, running through all these guys at such a young age, it's like a young Mike Tyson at the lower weights. I mean, he's just taking guys out. Um, I, uh, I mean, I know that Nervaez is a little bit faded. Um, kind of reminds me of the fight I thought we all would see and hope to see, you know, prior to the whole, like, Rigo schooling Donaire, you know, people were asking what's next for Donaire, and I always said, why not have a, a super fight with Chris John in Asia? Um, because, you know, that would be, just be really, really huge. Uh, and we all knew that Chris John was fading, and we all knew Donaire would probably win that fight, but we all knew that the fight would have significance and that it would be an amazing scalp to add to his resume. And ultimately, that fight, um, never actually happened, and uh, Vatika was the one that ultimately defeated Chris John before Donaire had a chance to. But, you know, I feel like Narvaez was probably more ripe for the picking. But nonetheless, uh, you know, uh, just a couple of years ago, Donaire struggled with this guy, and as Kurt said, couldn't put him away, uh, couldn't do what he wanted to do with him. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, just, yeah, just, just basically, what, 18, 18 and 24 months later, uh, in a way did this to him. Uh, and that that is an achievement that needs to stand on its own. Um, you know, this is a guy who, like Kurt said, had, had defended his title for so many years, championed two weight classes, uh, and at the very least, even if he thought he was going to lose, uh, not not lose like that. And um, and he, he is a bright star for the future. So, like I said, hopefully he can bring that excitement uh, that and and the fan base and everything that 
that, that the American media will start paying attention to them and paying attention to the lower weight classes generally because there's some great fights happening down there. And the great thing about it is that because the money involved isn't that big, because the lower weight class is just the money has never been like that, that super money, the kind of Floyd and Pacquiao money or heavyweight money or anything like that. Because of that, everybody fights each other. At the lower weight classes, guys fight each other in a way that they don't at the, at the higher weight classes. And that is what boxing is supposed to be. That's what it's all about. And to me, the, the lower weight classes right now is really where it's at in boxing. If you want to see the best fight the best, you know, look at flyweight and under, pretty much. Well said. Kyle, mate, you want to go back to very briefly on to a news brother. And I've also got a question for all of these as well, just to finish off this, 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 this recap. Uh, yeah, I do. Just quickly, I just want to touch on what Donnie was saying. It's only recently that all the lower weight guys have started fighting each other. For years, the flyweight and super flyweight, the banter weight, you would not, you didn't see a unification from like 1985 to now. Really, these guys did not tend to fight each other. Obviously, you had a a brief sort of uh, moment where the super flyweight division plateaued. We had like Mihares fighting Darchinian and, and unifying three of the belts, but really, it hasn't really happened. I do. I am with Donnie. This is a, really is a sort of the best time, really, since the golden era of flyweights, which is the 60s, really, and in the, in the, in the early 70s. It's a fantastic era. With uh, Takuma Inoue, who's um, also trained by Naoya's dad, uh, Shingo, who must be trainer of the year, um, he beat a, a, a talented fighter, actually, a, a decent Argentinian on the on the undercard, uh, Daniel Narvaez. I don't, I don't think he's related to Omar Narvaez. Uh, but basically, this, this lad is fantastic as well. I've only seen bits of him. There isn't much of him. But um, he's just beating a guy who's, who's fought for the lineal flyweight championship. And he's uh, he's beating him in what is, I think, his fourth or fifth fight. And even though now you're a new age, getting all the, you know, all the props at the moment, I think you're going to be surprised. I think his brother might end up just as good as he is. Yeah, well, I agree with that. You just, just going back briefly to what you said at the start of your kill and what Donnie, what you said, I think anyone at Flybait from probably, say, like the top 15, maybe stretching to the top 20, have all got a chance of picking up a strap of some sort. Um, I really think it's, it's so in-depth division. I think it's a great division. I've been following it for many years. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And now is the happening time for it to, to, to be actually following it, especially over the course of the last year or so. But uh, one thing I picked up on Mixter, guys, uh, I just reading through some of the comments here. Local Mexican has actually made a comment here. He reckons that Nayu Inu would beat Roman Gonzalez. Now, I really don't know if he would. I would love to see the fight. And I'll tell you one thing, I think that fight's an all-out war, in my personal opinion. Give me your thoughts. I think it's a big shout. and um, Super after... fight. Yes, yeah, absolutely super fight. It's yeah, a big super fight, fight definitely. Um, I also think that the way Inoue's been fighting, I think that, you know, that's a distinct possibility. The way he just blasts through people, you know, for someone to say that he could beat Gonzalez, who's got what, 41 fights now, and just the opponents that he's beat and, the, you know, the people that he's been mowing through, I think it is a very close fight. Um, I would personally give Gonzalez a slight favour in that, but, um, you know, maybe the end of next year or, or sorry, end of this year um, or early next year, that fight could be a real possibility. You guys want to weigh in when you think about that fight? If yeah, it's possible? I, I, I wouldn't want to pick it at this stage. And it's not because we haven't seen enough of now, you anyway. It's just a case of when you get two guys like that that are so well matched, anything could happen. Anything could happen whatsoever. You, I mean, you can look at someone like Michael Nunn and Sambu Kalambe. No one would have thought that would have been a first round knockout. No one would have thought that uh, Tommy Morrison would probably help box George Foreman. Anything can happen in boxing. And when they're yeah. so well matched like this, I think anything can happen. I probably would give a very, very slight edge to Gonzalez, but that might be because he's been at world level a bit longer and we wouldn't expect a guy like Inoue to destroy him in a few rounds. I think Gonzalez is far better than... Uh, I think Gonzalez would have beaten um, Omar Narvaez, to be honest with you. I think he probably would have beaten him by decision. I think Inoue is a tad more explosive. But the thing is, he relies on speed and Gonzalez relies on his timing, so I think they, they're both well-rounded offensive machines and I do, I'm, I'm with uh, with Andy really I think it could be a bit of a tear-up to be honest with you well I'm loving do, the way any, do anyone see I'm oh, sorry I'm just going to say I'm, I'm loving the way that what they're doing just now with some of the Japanese fighters like, you know they're, it's not really about building up or padding the records you, you can maybe say they're maybe padding the record with Murata but then again he's co-promoted I think I think it's not about uh, building up a, a profile is a bit legacy for some of these Japanese fighters. Now, yeah, I know he signed a contract when he when he joined the uh, Oashi gym that said 
he signed a contract obviously I don't know the ins and outs of it it's in Japanese but he signed a contract saying I cannot take any easy fights there you go <laughs> really <laughs> yeah yeah whoever they pick for him he's, he's got a fight I wish I wish you would put that in Danny Garcia's contract put it in everyone's contract <laughs> everyone's yeah. 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 Hope, hopefully, we don't, hopefully we don't get uh, you know an expansion of the existing market and get Heyman Sports Japan because then it, that'll be oh all over. God. Really quick. <laughs> oh God! Okay, Kurt, mate, are we are we just just lastly are we on basically? Oh, obviously, as, as hardcore fans and basically we've been championing this guy for a wee bit now, are we possibly on the on the cusp of maybe slightly overhyping this guy? Um, wow, well, he's he, he do, he's not going to get the attention he really deserves, you know, in in America, for instance, because of you know who he is and where he fights. I mean, was it the Boxing Writers Awards? They didn't even they didn't even mention him. Didn't even mention him. So, I think if anyone's overhyping him, I mean, fair play, and it'll get him more attention. And you know, it's it's up to him to carry on pr- proving how good he is. And I think you know, they're looking like he's going to want to fight the best, and he's going to put on great fights. And the fight against Gonzalez, I mean. When when you think of that fight, that you just think, well, I'll bleed when I see it because when there's a fight that you know is just going to be fantastic. Sadly for us, it, they haven't really seemed to happen that over the years. So hopefully we get to see that. Well, you know, I mean, maybe uh, I don't know if anyone's talked about this one, but maybe in a way versus Estrada because Estrada's promoted by Top Rank and uh, there's you know, talk I mean, about Estrada going up to Super Flyweight as well for what I'm hearing. Yeah, I mean, I know that. I know. It, I know it's difficult, but I'm just saying. Uh, you know, he's a Mexican fighter. He's got a good following. Um, you know, obviously, he would sell well in America just because Estrada's Mexican and, you know, it's a very formidable opponent who comes with a, an amazing track record. Uh, so maybe, I mean, I know it would be a tough fight to make, and you, know, you said he's moving up and everything, but, but that would be a fight I could see uh, one of the major networks in the United States picking up. Um, uh, but, I mean, yeah, just really, like, there's just such a treasure trove of great fights uh, that can be made down down in those weight classes, and I just wish uh, I wish to pay attention to it. Um, but hey, you know, yeah, like like someone said, you know, can he really be overhyped? No, I think he can't be hyped enough because uh, the more hype he gets, uh, it'll force uh, fans to pay attention to him. I don't know if we Steve back here. If you are back, Steve gives me a shout in the in the Skype shout, uh, chat, mate. I'm just moving on now. This is the to the Box Asylum uh, award ceremony. Now, as I say, we've got quite a few. You heard you heard uh, myself, Tommy, Alex, and Kyle at the last podcast late last year, uh, and we put that out to yeah. Steve's back. Good stuff. Uh, we put that out to our members and we tweeted it out on Twitter to get people to vote and let us know who they felt like A, the fighter, fighter of the year, KO of the year, rounds of the year, etc, etc. So starting off with fighter of the year in ascending order. Number three with 20.59% of the votes, Mayu Inu, who as Kurt says didn't even get a, a mention or nomination from the Boxing Writers Association of America, so shame on them. Uh, number two, Sergey Kovalev with twenty six point four seven percent of the vote, and um, the winner, I think everybody would be probably not even surprised at this one, with forty four point one two percent of the vote, Terence Crawford. Guys, he's happy with the the one, two, and three position there. No, no. What would you say? And you? I would, yeah, I would say him, but I mean, to be honest, I, I don't. Crawford, I can understand. I mean, he's he's came from nowhere really, and he's. You know, he's not only had some impressive performances. He's, you know, gone to Scotland. He's won the title the right way. You'd say he's also built a a, a lot, a big fan base. You know, and African Americans, it's it's looked upon as quite tough for them to do. If you think of like guys like Tim Bradley, Paul Williams, and he's came from nowhere and he's done all that, and he he looks like he's going to be very tough to beat in the future. But I mean, I'm a big fan of Kovalev, but he, he had a great win over a 50 year old man, and that was a good win. But he hasn't really done anything else. He's sure no fault of his own. I'd pick him to beat Stevenson, but for me, it's you know, Inyo should definitely have pipped Kovalev. Some people are saying that Inyo didn't deserve it because he had that fight against the Thai fighter Kokia Jim. Anybody, Steve? I think Kyle Kills dropped away there. Steve, you got any I'm comment back. you want to make on that? I'm back. Are you no, back? You may get yeah. Kyle on about about that because I have nothing of value to add to the Inyo Kokia Jim discussion. <laughs> Well, what I'm going to say is, boys, basically, if you see a Thai fighter who's about 30 and 0 and he ain't fought no one, it's probably because he isn't that good. The best Thais, that they tend to come out of Muay Thai background and they get pushed a lot quicker. 
Um, I don't think it was a terrible win. He was a decent enough fighter certainly not a bad fight considering he beat Hernandez before and Narvaez afterwards it's, I think it's just people being picky I've, I've got a guy on your Facebook page the other day went mental at me and said you know you're trying to be smart and I think people just don't like it when you pick a fighter then they're not too aware of do you know what I mean I think I don't yeah. know maybe they feel a bit threatened by it or something but some guy on your Facebook page the other day was going mental at me and just calling him. me a wanker God knows, maybe. He thought I was right, Wanker, because I wanted to see a new A Quadras as one of my top five fights next year or whatever it was. He was going, he was going fucking mental, mate. And I, I thought, well, you know, I like a new A. I want to see him fight good fighters. And he's like, oh, well, we all want to see Brook versus Khan. So, you know, why don't you want to see Brook versus Khan? Because you're trying to be a clever C U N T or whatever. And, uh, you know, I, I think some people don't like the fact that a new A's getting picked and all year they thought their boy Terence Crawford was going to get it. Do you know what I mean? So, and, and and whatever they come out with is usually, oh, well, you know, uh, whoever was ranked number two or number three or whatever. And I don't know, man. I think people feel a bit fretted by a new A getting picked for it when, I don't know, he's, just, he's not American. He's not, he's not a Westerner, is he? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Alex, you disappointed that Crawford got it did he deserve it I can't really knock the choice of Crawford obviously he, he has done a lot uh, over the past year he's really just jumped out into the fray of things um, you know he absolutely dominated his division he cle- pretty much cleaned it out I mean he didn't get all the belts but he beat uh, people that mattered he, he beat the number one he became you know the lineal champion, I suppose, and now he's planning to move up to a ne- new weight. I mean, you know, fair credit to him. He looks excellent, and I don't think any of us expect him to, you know, sort of drop off or do any worse next year. We, in fact, I expect most of us expect him to capitalise on that and do even better at 140 and even uh, welterweight. But you know, anyway, he had a better year for me. Uh, I think a lot of the votes for Crawford was simply because, you know, we put the votes up, we put the a poll up before in a way fought and then you know people just voted before they even saw the fight so um yeah i mean i can't begrudge it but in a way it would have been my number one donnie um close call like i said i mean the thing is anybody who'd been watching <coughs> omar narvaez's fights recently knew that he was a little bit ripe uh, for the picking but i mean nonetheless like i said i mean in a way's achievements in, this, in the sport this year uh especially so early in his career, are uh, really unprecedented. And um, I would have voted for Inouye. I actually didn't vote, unfortunately. I was taking my exams, I think, when the poll, <laughs> when the poll went out. But, um, but anyways, uh, I don't think it would have made a difference. Uh, Crawford, though, uh, you know, we like to see guys go after the lineage in weights. He did that. Uh, and uh, Gamboa was, uh, even though he was coming out from weight, uh, you know, a fighter that had gotten a lot of hype over the years, uh, and this was like the big moment, and you know, and Crawford struggled in the fight. He struggled with the speed, and he showed that he knew how to make adjustments. He showed that he had uh, adaptability, uh, switching from orthodox to southpaw uh, to try to figure out, you know, um, you know, basically how, how to how to time and counter uh, Gambo effectively. Uh, I mean, he he showed a lot of his skills in that fight. And then, of course, getting the lineage with Beltran uh, really was the icing on the cake. Uh, he is a, a great candidate for fighter of the year. And moreover, I might say that I personally believe that if uh, that uh, certain fight that we aren't allowed to talk about doesn't happen, uh, I do believe that it won't be Jesse Vargas next. I do think it, Manny Pacquiao will, uh, if he doesn't fight, Floyd will fight uh, uh, Terrence Crawford. And I believe that Terrence Crawford will give him uh, a defeat. Interesting. Up next was the winner of for KO of the year. Uh, number f- oh, just before I do, I said just oddly enough, uh, all the people, uh, all the people who were actually on that list. You know, Amir Mansour didn't even get a vote for the Freddie Cassie knockout, which was pre- which was pretty brutal actually. And the, the thing is, I want to say as well, I, I don't think Pavetkin Manuel Char even got a mention either. No, I think it might, a- I think it maybe got one mention. I think. I that, was one a, that was a good knockout yeah. as well. There was a lot of good ones this year, to be yeah. fair. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At number three, Nicholas Walters over Victor Chinian, 14.29%. Number two, the rematch between Carol Froch and George Groves, 24.43%. But the number one winner, Steve, you'll be happy to hear this one, at, at 39.29% of the vote, Andy Lee over John Jackson. 
Yeah, that's a good one. I voted for that one myself. And um, fair play to Lee. He had a couple of good knockouts, didn't he? The one against Korobov was a good one as well. And uh, hopefully he'll be getting another one soon. Apparently, I uh, hear he's fighting Patrick Nielsen on March the 14th, I reckon, in Dublin. Yeah. So Average fighter. Uh-huh. That yeah. should be a good, a nice showcase. Well, what happened to the uh, fight with Saunders? Well, that's what Fight One wants to know. <laughs> fight One wants <laughs> to know that one as well, because he says, yeah, there's a fight that's happening next, don't worry, worry about that. Yeah, okay, Frank. Hope did they make any billboard posters up. Probably look to put Saunders in an easier fight than look for the summer, I imagine. But yeah, I've, I've, it'll happen nothing. I think Andy Lee wanted to have his first so-called yeah. title fight back in Ireland, and yeah. they won it in, in London, so they've had to just, you know, I don't, I don't see a problem with it. I definitely, I have no problem with that either. I actually... On the KO of the year, I think I'm going to anger a lot of my fellow Car Frotch Hate Club members because I actually went for Frotch over Groves too. Oh, like yeah, I, I, I agree with that. The whole, the whole event, and I mean, Frotch, no one really expects him to just, you know, put him out cold with one shot, I don't think so. And it's just the whole event and the timing of the shot, it just. No, I think that that deserved it for me. Yeah, begrudgingly. And, and, and slightly, slightly, if not even, then slightly behind in the fight. Uh, you know, Groves was looking good up until that point. Um, and, you know, on that stage, I had to sort of add that, you know, I mean, because Carl Frotch was getting so much hate, even from people that, like, were sort of neutral towards Frotch in the beginning, if it's possible to be neutral towards Frotch. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, he was like, you know, people really resented him. It was almost like the way they resented Bradley for uh, taking something from Pacquiao unjustly. You know, they felt like Frotch was losing that fight. He got a, a bullshit stoppage against Groves the first time. And Frotch went out in there and said, you know what, uh, I am the better fighter. And he put a, a, a really resounding uh, ending uh, to that entire Frotch Groves saga. Uh, and uh, like, like, like Chris said, you know, on that stage and in that moment, uh, to me, for, uh, yeah, that, that, that KO was, was, has to be KO of the year, in my opinion. Let's not forget the most important thing. Carl Frotch is still a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is this is undebatable actually. Next up, rounds of the year. Now, number three, sixteen point six seven percent. Vladimir Klitschko, Kubra Pulev, round one, where we saw uh, Klitschko basically get wobbled with a jab, and then he just basically comes into war mode and fucks up Pulev. Round two, sorry, it's round two. Hi, we'll see round two. Uh, 12, 22 uh, 22.22% of the vote. Um, the moment where a certain Bernard Hopkins sticks his tongue out in round 12 just sends <laughs> Kovalev into complete Terminator mode. That was, that was my favourite one. Yeah, just the same to uh, try and fuck <laughs> him up. But uh, the, the winner is actually a domestic fight from Britain. Well, not the well, domestic fighter level, I'd say anyway. 33.33% of the vote. Tommy Coyle, uh, Daniel Bruzuela, round 6. Oh, yeah. Round six. That's who Great won that fight one as well. Yeah. Good fight. Very good fight. Great fight. And it's actually, I'm, I'm actually, actually uh, been hearing it on other, other podcasts. You know, some of the Brits are really pushing that fight uh, over the course, or the tail end of last year, trying to, trying to let the Yanks know about that fight. And uh, to be fair, some of them did go back and watch it, and they did say as it was a very underlooked fight, and it needed to have more, more exposure. So it's good to hear that the Americans are getting a chance to, to see it. Up next, trainer of the year. Uh, number three, 11.76%, Abel Sanchez. We've got uh, joint slot number two, 17.65%, Freddie Roach and Joe Gallagher. Boo. And the winner, it was quite unanimous almost actually, 47.6%, John David Jackson. Where's Tim Lane? He's still in the cage. Oh. <laughs> Honestly, I, I mean, I'm not. I know you. I'm not going to get hate for this. But where the fuck is Virgil Hunter? Who? Virgil Hunter? Oh God. Who's he? <laughs> oh, the horse whisperer. The horse whisperer. I know him. I. <laughs> man, come um, on, man. I mean, look. Come look, on. Man. Listen, Alexander shot the shit, man. Come on, you fuck. He shot. He shot. What he said? He said. He said. What he said. What, <laughs> he said one fight, one fight this year with Amir Khan. Who else has he had? To, he, he saw Angulo get destroyed of Canelo. Who else did he fucking see get destroyed? I want to know why Shingo Inoue is not up for it. He's got yeah. an amazing year. He would have been put in the other column. But a, a trainer, a trainer. I mean, like the thing is, all right. People said about Virgil Hunter, all right, he's not that great. Andre Ward just happened to walk into his gym, and he's the luckiest bastard that ever lived. 
How much better has Khan looked in his most recent two fights? <laughs> See him in with a puncher. See him in with a puncher. See him in with a puncher. Yeah. To be honest, Kyle, what you just said there about, uh, about Inu's father is, to be honest, even though they put his name up forward, I don't think he would have got... He'd been lucky to get maybe one or two votes. Because not many people know about the Asian scene. That's the pro- biggest problem. Yeah, no, nah, that's fair enough. But I, I do think he was definitely trained during the year. He's got the two brothers and he's got uh, Matsumoto as well. So Yeah. I think you know he's not going to win it, but I think McDonald with James DeGaulle has done a really good job this show as well because a lot of people are saying he should get rid of him and get a new trainer, but DeGaulle has looked, I thought, the best he's looked since he turned pro, to be honest. Up next, prospect of the year. I don't think anybody's going to have any much problem with this one, but I was really surprised at number three, Earl Spence Jr., 17.24%. Donnie. Number what? two... 24.14% is Artar Beterbiev, and the winner, 31.3%, Anthony Joshua. Ah, oh, no way. He's not Seriously, better than mate. That's, that's, who, that's who got prospect of the year, Anthony I Joshua. I was expecting um, Vadejo to be in the top three. I think he yeah, finished at number four, actually, I think. I, I think, you know, with Joshua being a heavyweight and having the hype machine behind him, I think, you know, he's... It's easy to pick him. I mean, he's he's looked the part so far, and I, I just think you know he, he does look good for, for to him. But he needs to we need to see him against someone who's going to hit him back. But I think he's an easy pick to be honest. Yeah. Oh, the thing is, I think. I'm sorry, Donny, you first in Kyle, mate. Well, I'm just saying I think he's an easy pick too. But the thing is, when I try to pick prospect of the year, I try to think to myself, is this the same si- sort of guy that I could see myself picking as prospect of the year? next year um and how many of you could see yourself picking anthony joshua as prospect of the year next year i think a lot of us would because no one he's not going to step up to like eliminator level or even world level maybe uh i think until at least 18 months so i think it's still a little bit too early in his career to give it to him that said out of all the candidates i think he has looked the best but then again it's early in his career of course he's going to kyle uh, I would have picked Alexander Ruzik because I actually do think he can step it up next year. I think he's top 10 ranked one at WBO. He's only really fought good solid journeyman so far. He ain't put a foot wrong. I, 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 people keep slagging me off for it, but I guarantee you in a few years' time, it won't be Anthony Joshua at the top of the heavyweight rankings. It'll be Ruzik. I reckon he's absolutely phenomenal. Steve, you anything you want to add to that one, mate? For any prospects of the year, especially from Ireland or anything? Mm, not really. I, I voted for Videjo myself. I yeah. I was happy enough with him, but I'm just thinking over here, there's there's a few. I mean, the amateur system is brilliant, so they're always churning good ones out. John Joe Nevin, obviously, is one to watch. And uh, there's a guy actually at like middleweight, D. Walsh, who won the Irish title at the end of last year. You might be hearing a bit about him at least at British level next year, but nothing, nothing to you know any um, to take over the Frampton mantle yet. No. Right. Fight of the year now, as I said before, 2014 was pretty shit. I mean, there was very, very little of shining beacons of light and the absolute sea of bullshit last year, the type of fights we got. But uh, this fight of the year vote actually kind of was very, very split. Now, we actually had a three-way finish for number three spot at 10.71% of the votes. And there's as follows, Travis Dickinson against Matty Clarkson. Francisco Rodriguez Jr. against Kantasura Takayama and Robert Guerrero against Yoshiro Kamagai. That's who finished third. Number two was a joint finish, uh, 14.29%. Tommy Coyle and Daniel Brizuela and Terence Crawford against Yukoris Gamboa. But the winner was at 28.57%. Lucas Matisse against John mm-hmm. Molina. Yeah, personally, I'd agree with that. I mean, it, it wasn't expected going into that fight, was it, no. I think? And it shocked, really, everyone. It was a really good fight. I mean, like you said, last year wasn't a great year, mm-hmm. so I think it's, it's very thin, to be honest, compared to previous years. Mm-hmm. Very thin. Very thin. I enjoyed Dickinson Clarkson myself, no matter the levels. It was, just a, it was just a really enjoyable fight to watch. Don, are you still on the phone, mate? He's not there. Yes, yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, I think you're getting text messages. I can hear you fucking vibrating. Uh, yeah, that's because uh, the Green Bay Packers just defeated the Dallas Cowboys, and they're going to be in the NFC Championship uh, next week against the Seahawks. So well, I've watched the second quarter. That actually is like minus four degrees or something in there just now. Or something. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's always cold up at Green Bay uh, with the windshield minus four. But uh, but yeah, any, everybody who knows me knows that I'm a huge Green Bay Packers fan, and so they're all texting me, being like, you know, what a great game. So right. sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Warrior of the year. Glad to see that Carl Fox didn't even make the cut, which is good news. <laughs> uh, number three was a joint finish, 8.33%. Paul Williams and Vitelli Klitschko. Number two, 20.83%. Magomed Abdusalamov. But uh, 50% of the vote, I think almost everyone was, was quite happy. Uh, we're also happy for uh, the family as well. Young Kennedy Cunningham, who went through a, life, was a heart transplant, had to go through uh, so really good yep. to see the, the Cunningham family finally get their daughter through the operation and uh, i actually seen some stuff on Facebook actually some videos and stuff they're walking at the hospital kinda. everything was documented in, on Facebook and it was good to see the family kinda, all running about her and sitting up and laughing away and stuff and finally walking out the hospital so really good to hear so kind of Cunningham you are a warrior of the year but following up I don't think that's going to be disputable, actually, in honesty, guys. I know it's sad to hear about what happened to Abdusalamov again. I think he's picked up some sort of infection. He's back in the hospital. It's a sad, sad state of affairs, actually. So thoughts go out to the Abdusalamov family. Uh, finally, our last vote of the uh, the year went to Wanker of the Year. And I think this is, going, this is, this is a foregone conclusion, <laughs> obviously. Number three, Floyd Mayweather Jr. at 17.14%. 25.71% Carol Froch and the champion of Wanker of the Year, 37.14%. Does anyone want to guess? Eddie Hearn? Was it, was <laughs> it the man, man, who, man who attacked us on YouTube? A man Your podcast's not worth a carrot. <laughs> <laughs> man is, a man has offered me out on the fucking YouTube. He wants to fucking fight me or something. I don't know if he's fucking serious or not there. But fight him, Andy. Make sure the belt's on the uh, WBA belt's on the line. I want to catch weight, though, mate. I'm, all, I'm only a middleweight. He's a fucking heavyweight, you know. Uh, you won't eat you. You've got nothing to worry about. Yeah, I, I suppose... carry power. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't taking th- off twenty pounds. <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't I ain't dredging at the weights, mate. I, I do think though. No, I mean, if if this award had kept going and we'd still be inviting, I think Brona really could have snuck in there and beat poor Tony. To be honest, We've leaving the comments. last ounces of me soul on the scale. <laughs> <laughs> That's an Irish, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I get I get more views to a fart than you do in your podcast. <laughs> it's as simple as that, mate. I'd simple rather that, die mate. in there. I'd rather die when I run away for twelve rounds. You you're know what I mean? Rat. Yeah, you fucking rat. Is have it now, then? <laughs> I think he's saying the name of that long train station. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that's the one of the year. Tony Bell, you well done, sir. Oh, did he win? Did he, he won it, win? He it was it's a voice. massive shot, that was. <laughs> massive shot. He, 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 wanted, he wanted, like, secretary to the Belmont running away. Yeah. <laughs> so, also, knows there's oh. not going to be a Bell of the Week award this week because um, we, are running, we are going to be running pretty late, so we're going to dump it this week and put it on the next week. So, it'll be the second show in a row that we have to vacate the title. But moving on next to our Twitter questions, um, Alex, this is from Michael Geraghty. He's asking, is Ricky Burns about to be used as cannon fodder in his upcoming Vegas world title fight? Well, my knowledge is there's no world title fight, and I don't know who he's meant to be fighting, because I've heard Omer Figueroa, who I think's injured, and I've heard Rancis Bertholomew get mentioned, but he's a super featherweight title holder, so he's meant to be moving up in weight, so where's the world title coming from? Oh, God knows. I mean, maybe they're fighting for um, Crawford's belt, because he's supposed to be moving up, isn't he? So maybe they're vacating that belt, and maybe Burns... Maybe one's getting hold of that, but yeah, I think he is being used as cannon fodder. I think he's being stuck on one of these cards to draw more attention to uh, either Jamie McDonald or to Carl uh, Froch or something. He's probably uh, Juan Diaz, by the looks of it, according to WBO rankings. Juan Diaz. When, when they say world title shot, I mean, what what kind of world title shot is it? Is it one of these fake ones? Because they said that the same about cleverly and really he's fighting um, Jürgen Brahma they're looking to match him with, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Juan, who's Juan Diaz who lost to Nate Campbell? No, he's so one. So one ago, I used to have my Marquez in the first fight. Yeah, who was he back? I suppose again? that's a bit winnable yeah, for him, back. I guess. Anybody hear anything about it? Uh, and Paul Ricky needs the money, doesn't he, at the moment? So yeah, it's looking that way actually, which is a bit of a shame. Um, 
but uh, that's the way it Well, goes. Eddie owes it to him. Eddie should pay it off. Eddie should get oh. in the ring and fight the fights for him, the bloody cock. <laughs> Moving on, Donny, this one comes in from Jake at Canton, is it Cantona underscore collar, so that's Eric Cantona actually. If no Pacquiao or Mayweather for Can in April or May, who should he face? And you can't pick Brooke. Wait, I can't pick Brooke? You can't pick Brooke. Oh. Um, rematch with Garcia? Mm-hmm. It's good well, well, I'd like to see Team Bradley fight. The rumor, yeah, there's rumors like of that, that isn't too, there? But yeah, you got political shit with that, but um, but I mean, yeah, sure, that that'd be great. I mean, you know, that fight was supposed to happen, it didn't happen. Bradley's looking a little bit more vulnerable now than when he used to be. So it was a, there was a while when no one in the world would have picked uh, Khan to beat Bradley after you know some of Khan's uh, setbacks, and uh, now all of a sudden Bradley has this uh, tough fight with Chavez. Even if you think you won it, I mean, it still was a little bit ugly. Uh, and Tim Bradley didn't look like Tim Bradley, and and Khan's looking sensational lately. So, oh, yeah, I mean that that fight, <laughs> that fight. Oh God! What about that um, Yoshihiro Kama guy? He signed with Heyman, wasn't it, or Golden Boy? He recently signed with. You want to see him fight Khan? Yeah, why not? Oh my God! How many people would shit on that fight? Don't even fucking start with that shit. <laughs> Khan would get. Yeah, well, this is a hypothetical like, question here, Donny, because obviously he's looking at... Fight. Yeah, Who else but is going to fight? I want to see him fight Furman. Yeah, Furman. Yeah, yeah Furman, but you know, they're going, like... they're, going to, they're going to hide behind that. You know, nobody knows who Furman is. Doesn't want to see the, Donny doesn't want to see the Furman fight, because he knows Khan's going to get chained. To tell you the truth, I actually do want to see the Thurman fight. The only the only thing is, is that I do acknowledge it's a 50-50 fight, because he could get knocked <laughs> 50, out. 50-50. <laughs> No, I mean, he could, I mean, look, how did Thurman look against Bundu? But I mean, very good. Not great. Hey, yeah, he schooled him. I, I, I do Bundu can take a that. shot. Look, look, Khan could absolutely get knocked out by Thurman, but I do think that he has the perfect skill set to trouble Floyd Mayweather. I'd like to see that fight first, and then I'd like to see him fight Thurman. But in other words, there's only so many opponents out there that can actually f- provide interesting fights to Floyd. So I want to see Khan fight him before he retires. Uh, and that would be now because there's only two fights left on the Showtime contract. You have May, the September one is out, Ramadan, so there's basically I want to see, one, I want one to shot. See, I want to see him fight the, the guy that the guy in Sky Sports News mentioned. I want to see him fight George Groves. Great fight. Oh, great fight. Remember, remember that oh. comment? That was fucking funny as anything, that fucking prick. Sky great Sports fight. are hilarious for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was some, Was that an audience member? No, 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 that was a, one, of the, one of the presenters. Yeah, one, one of the, the presenters mentioned. <laughs> they're, always, they're always doing that, though. I remember when um, Klitschko fought Solis and they were showing it and they showed the way and the guy said, Solis uh, uh, made the weight comfortably. I mean, I just thought, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't make any weight comfortably. Uh, was, it, <laughs> no. what did, uh, was it Holling? <laughs> no, it was one of the news oh, reader they, guys. Don't mention, mean about Holling. Holling. No, don't mention Holling today, for Christ's sake. Please don't mention negative Holling. about Nick Holling. Not today. Uh, Steve, this is from Andrew Lee Evans, and, I, and my answer, my, my answer, to this is actually yes. Oh. And the question is as follows: Will Jay Z, sorry, with Jay Z splashing his cash, be a good thing for boxing, or just cause yet more political issues in the U.S. The boxing scene? My answer to that is yes. You think it'll cause more trouble? Yep. Obviously, because he's not going to let his uh, Heyman's not going to let his fighters face off against Jay Z's fighters or Gary Shaw's fighters, shall we say? No, that's right. He's not going to let it, and I'm this, yeah, I'm worried about this because it, I, we we can't afford to have another year like last, last year. Because I mean, last year was just like the year of the showcase fight, wasn't it? It was, it was the year of bad advice, and the resp- you know the responsibility lies with the likes of these advisors, managers, and promoters, and also the TV networks. You know, who are putting too much emphasis on these thi- on things like unbeaten records and attaching stigmas to losses, but w- we don't really need another player in the game, no matter how much money he's got, is going to add more complications, because it, it, these guys are whispering in the ears of their fighters. How many, how many fighters have we seen turn down meaningful fights and paydays over the last year? I mean, look at the likes of Quillen, you know, he turned down the big Korobov payday and never fought for the rest of the year. Santa Cruz, talking about Rigondo, Frampton, Quigg, Ended up fighting Mihares, and now he's fighting this Ruiz. Same with Stevenson, same with Demetrius Andrade. He's turning down career paydays, and, and he only had one fight last year. There's, 
they're completely deluded, a lot of them. So Jay Z is just going to add to the complications, I think. Doesn't um, doesn't Jay Z have like an is- issues or like a past with Al Heyman or like troubles? Oh with yeah, through the yeah, music industry. Yeah. Ran a mute the music business, I think. I think that's the way. Yeah. I think Him and Beyonce. Yeah, I think that um, basically we can't see Jay Z as a problem because Al Heyman isn't going to work with anyone anyway. Now he's got Richie Schaefer, he's not going to work with any of the Golden Boy fighters. Wait a minute, mate. Wait a minute. See, on Schaefer, I was reading today actually that there's rumours going about that the part of the agreement with Golden Boy with Schaefer is he is not allowed to work for at least between a year and two years. That is the rumour. Yeah, but either, either way though, Al Heyman he isn't going to work with top rank. On NBC, he is going to do the showcase mismatch fights and it doesn't matter whether he won't work with Jay-Z or not because he's not going to work with anyone else anyway I think Jay-Z probably got on quite well I think I reckon it, I could see him working with Bob Arum I could see him working with anyone because he's a real businessman do you know what I mean he's not going to bomb out like 50 cent he's not stupid do you know what I mean I think it would do alright and he's spending money because he wants to put on good fights I reckon he will put on good fights as well I reckon the more fighters he gets more money he throws about, I reckon he might actually see some good fights. Fuck Al Heyman, he ain't going to do nothing, mate. And, you know, regardless of who's in the game, Al Heyman ain't doing nothing. It's down Funny. to the TV. Do you think it's down, sorry, uh, Andy, um, do you think it's down to the TV people to put their foot down and sort of get oh, in the, yeah, in the middle of Oh, yeah, mate. Oh, yeah. Look at HBO. Look at H- HBO went along and dealing with it. Eh? I mean, if you look at it, right, 2013, great, great year for boxing. Showtime, they're like, oh, everybody, since Showtime were taking over, HBO were, 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 you know, they were dragging in the dirt. You know, they were like, fucking, you know, where's the finish line? But then, if you just noticed last year, things turned around about Showtime were starting to flag with some of their shitty fucking showcases, and HBO were putting on the better fights. Yeah, Showtime are com- were complicit in all the Hyman nonsense last year. Mm-hmm. But this this is nothing new. This is what Heyman does. He was, at, boxing. he was at HBO, and he got his guys dramatically overpaid for glorified sparring sessions taking place in front of 800 fucking people, like uh, Berto versus, uh, what is his name, Hernandez or whatever, down in Miami. $1.5 million dollar payday for Berto. $1.5 million dollars oh, to fight in front of fucking Vacant championship, people. vacant championship as well, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's completely ridiculous. And the way that he does it is, and it's just been a domino effect ever since there, and his power has amplified over time, which is that he has Floyd Mayweather. And at the time, HBO... Would have done anything to hang on to Floyd Mayweather. And all these guys have signed with Heyman around the welterweight and you know, super, uh, super welterweight and uh, light welterweight weight classes because they wanted a shot at Floyd Mayweather. And they thought, well, if I get in with Heyman, I can get a shot at Floyd Mayweather. And then from there, he built his boxing empire all around that. It's been a long domino effect. All right. And he's never. I mean, you could name, like, I mean, you could say what you want. Like, you know, Bob Arum is not, and I mean, you know, Dig is probably listening to this right now, Mark, and is probably saying, you know, oh, well, it's a big wank fest for, like, Bob Arum. So, like, he's a, he, he's no no better than Eamon either. But the thing is, is that even if it's out of necessity, he does work with other promoters. And you could name a bunch of them that he has worked Don with. Don King, to- he hated him for years and they fucking worked together to put on big fights. Exactly. He hated Don King for, for decades and decades. They were bitter rivals. But when the big, big fights needed to get made, uh, even if they had to go through an intermediary to negotiate things, they did it. They got those big fights done. He's recently worked with Eddie Hearn. He's worked with 50 Cent. He's worked with uh, uh, Main Events. He's worked with um, uh, Gary Shaw. He's worked with all these other promoters out there. Uh, he's worked with Lou DiBella to make Sergio Martinez versus uh, Chavez Jr. I mean, he's all over that oil. You know, but but Heyman doesn't work with anybody unless he's taken someone from the other promoter's stable who's a you know basically just a journeyman and matching up with one of his guys. Other, it's either internal matchups or it's mismatches, uh, and that's that's what Heyman provides. Really yes. optimistic about this NBC series, and I want to be optimistic too, but I'm cautiously optimistic because the thing is. I am very, very excited to see, you know, the more boxing that people can see that they don't have to pay for, like, that's a fantastic thing for the sport. It's only good for the sport. It'll only grow boxing in general. But the thing is, people got to be satisfied with what they see. And if they're not getting competitive fights, if they're just getting 
the equivalent of WWE or WWF superstars. Remember that when, like, when we were kids, like when when you watched that shit, and there was like some like jobber out there with like you know the superstar, and you know there'd be back and forth, and then the superstar would knock him out, you know whatever they would pin him. I mean, that's essentially I think what he's going to bring to NBC Boxing. I really hope I'm wrong, but I doubt it. I don't think I'm wrong. I don't think that's what we're going to get because the thing is that the economics of it wouldn't make sense. He can't make these huge paydays for guys on a on a cable, uh, you know, budget network. I mean, like in other words, NBC Sports is like one of a, a, a you know 900 cable channels because anyone could tune in at any given point in time. Only four of those NBC dates that he has are actually on the network TV, the network NBC. You know, those are the ones I guess I'm looking forward to because that's actually they can actually afford to pay guys big money for those fights. But everything else you see on the cable channel. I'm afraid to say it's probably going to be glorified sparring sessions. I really hope I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. It's this this the problem, I mean, he, even if he kept it in house, he could make some really good fights for the guys. I mean, he signed got over 100 fighters. I mean, he could make some great fights. He doesn't do it. He puts his guy in with a total loser, let's be honest. And all these guys on forums are, you know, they're Floyd Mayweather fans who sing Heyman's praises. To me, they're not boxing fans. How can they be? How can you like what Heyman's doing? You know, as Andy said, he's a cancer of the sport, and I don't see it being any better. You know, he won't work with RM, he won't work with uh, Jay Z. Who he doesn't work with anyone. He he only works with you know what makes it best for him. And you know, if I was his fighters, they're turning down all this money. Broner's turned down money. Uh, Wilder's turned down money. Thurman, um, Peter Quillin's turned down money. I mean, yeah, they might be law now, but how long can they go turning down money when they're not fighting? I mean, or they're only fighting guys, uh, you know, losers. I mean. Listen, yeah, they they want to get paid well, fair enough, but they've also got to have some pride. They want to fight the best. They want to be the best. And Leo Santa Cruz's career has nosedived, and that's because of our Heyman. I think I'm going to ask this next question to the right person, actually, this after, we, after what you said there. Kyle, mate, this next question comes in from Will. Will Heyman continue to share your mismatches for 2015? I think I know your answer to this one. Well, here's the thing, actually. I've got a theory that he might show us a little bit of certain noise, so we get him in, his, in our good favours for a little bit, and then he might show a load of shit. Like it is so the time in 2013, basically. Well, well I think, like Donnie like Donny said, yeah, no, I think Donnie's right. The shows that are on the main NBC, maybe the first one, I was thinking maybe something, yeah, maybe something like Garcia Matisse, or maybe Garcia versus Broner, something like this. And then after that, we'll go, oh yeah, Al Heyman's okay. And he'll use that as an impetus to then feed us shit for the rest of the cards. All the, Donnie's right that... NBC Sports 1 isn't very big at all. It's not like being on a big NBC, NBC or Big Fox or something like that in the States, I'm sure. So I think those fights, they're going to be, I reckon, worse than like a lower-level Friday night fight sort of card. The main NBC cards will have to be half-decent because they'll be going out to, like, what, 20, 30 million people, you know, possibly, anyway. They, they've got a big market share. Um, so I think you might get something like half-decent, but... I'm not sure how much NBC are paying him per card. I can't see that they're going to pay him as much as Showtime would for a pay-per-view. He's paying them, is he not? Is he not paying them? What's the fucking point, then? He only sells out. That, that's that's right, Andy. He, he is paying them. He's basically... I think NBC was not necessarily down with the idea of doing, I think, what is it, 24 boxing cards? That they were interested in maybe making a smaller investment in boxing because boxing hasn't been on network slash, you know, free cable TV in a while. And... He said, well, how about this? I'll put up the money. I'll basically, in other words, if it doesn't make money, if the advertising, whatever the advertising uh, revenue is, if it doesn't cover the cost of the fighters' purses, I'll make up the difference, right? So uh, he took on the risk that NBC didn't want to take on. He's like, you know, basically you guys might win, but you can't lose. And they couldn't say no to that deal. So, you know, credit to him for like, you know, wanting to bring this out to the people. I mean, that's, you know that that's more than a lot of promoters would do, and he's putting up cash uh, to uh, to bring boxing to the people, and I'm happy with that. I just I just hope the fights are halfway decent. I don't see how it's going to work. No, and the thing is, what about Espinosa as well? I mean, how, what's he thinking he about went. this? That you know, Heyman's taking these fights to you know another station. To be honest, I mean, you know, he's going to want all the best fights on Showtime. Well, I I don't think that they're actually mutually exclusive, Kurt, because the thing is, these guys can get built up a little bit through the cable and and if they're lucky maybe through a main uh nbc uh you know network fight and then you know the basically his guys can't get the big paydays on nbc or on nbc sports anyways uh they may get a good payday on nbc 
but they can't get those big paydays. And so basically, I think you know you're going to see the fights in between the big fights, and then the big ones will be on Showtime. So he's kind of got the pay cable uh, network and Showtime to pay for the big ones, and then you know the ones to kind of keep his guys active in between that you know the people can see you know for free on NBC Sports, and that'll you know sort of keep them out there and, and keep them in the uh, the public consciousness. So I think that's the idea. In other words, yeah, you might say, okay, well he's taking his boxing to another network. Is Espinosa going to like that? But I actually think Espinosa will be relieved because maybe some of the sparring session type fights that he's paying uh, through the nose for right now, you know, now he can uh, those those ones can go to NBC and and you know the he can pay for the more quality ones. Well, Espinosa's bosses are going to have to start having a look at his um, contribution as well to all of this. I don't know how far he goes up on the Showtime ladder, but I mean, surely his position would be under some kind of scrutiny. I mean, yeah, that that's what's weird. I mean, I don't understand like why anyone would because Floyd Mayweather's under contract now right I mean he's under a, an air tag contract he's got the six fights or whatever I mean what's the incentive to just only play ball with one person I mean you know they're they're just they're just paying crazy money for fights that just I mean you know in a free market would just never command this kind of money I mean look at some of those Leo Santa Cruz fights the kind of fucking money that he's making for those like literally Literally speaking, a, a former sparring partner, a sparring <laughs> session, yeah. and this other guy coming up doesn't look that good either. I mean, I mean, and they're paying seven hundred and fifty thousand for the last one, six hundred and fifty thousand for the next one. And I mean, if this was a bidding market, this was like an auction, right? And HBO and NBC and all these, other, and ESPN and all these other networks were bidding on the fight. You'd never get anywhere near six hundred fifty thousand. So why the fuck? I mean, if I was if I was uh, Stephen Espinosa, I would say to myself, well, look. Heyman right now, the NBC deal isn't in place yet. He's only got one place to take his fighters. He's persona non grata at HBO. So he has to take it here to Showtime. So if I'm the only place he can take those fights, why the fuck am I paying all this money to, to, to show these fights? Because Heyman doesn't have any other option out there. He can't take it somewhere else. He has to take it to me. So, I mean, I have the bargaining power. Why, am I, why would I be paying these obscene sums of money for these horrible fights? Exactly. So someone else is going to have to take a closer look at what's going on. Well said, Dolly. Well said. Well said. Next question, Kurt, uh, comes from Rocco. Looks like the uh, Kell Brook Jojo Dan card will be part of a split pay per view on March 28th with maybe Froch and Chavez. Probably £17 pay per view. Is it worthy? Well, I won't be paying for it, so <laughs> there's that. But I think people will can't really complain that you're getting a guy, you know, defending his world title in Sheffield or wherever he's going to be defending it, and Froch in Vegas if that fight happens, which I'm still not sure about. But you know, it's, compare that to the um, Bow You Cleverly card, and yeah, I mean, I don't think many people complain to be honest. All right, next question. I'm going to answer this one first, then I'll open it up to everyone because I dare say some of us will have some comments on it because of the money. But uh, Nathan Newman's asking uh, predictions on where Adrian, well, I should say, AIDS ridden, no problem cloner will be <laughs> five years' time after turning down 40 million from Rock Nation. Well, my saying is this I think in five years' time, it's very possible that Adrian Cloner will be sucked out, fucked out, drugged out, looking for a handout. So that's my prediction on it. Guys, what do you think? Um, I think he'll be in a ditch. So that that way with a nine millimeter slug in the back of his head or something. Hopefully. Ooh, Jesus negativity. Christ. Negativity. Ooh. Negativity. I mean, that's the least of the worries. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll he'll still be around. I mean, look, it's not like I mean in the same way that Audley Harrison makes a fucking ass out of himself. Oh fuck! You have to mention him, eh? Sorry. How dare you me. compare Brown at all? <laughs> he'll probably be no, fighting. Like, he'll like, be like, fighting Audley he'll Harrison in about fight. five years, probably. <laughs> He'll lose a few fights. He'll be like, oh, I'm coming back to, like, reclaim my former glory. You know, I mean, he'll be doing all this bullshit. And, like, people will watch because they'll, they'll still want to see. Even if he's been sparked out by, like, four other dudes, they're just going to want to see him prone on the floor again just because it's broner and it's fun. So, I mean, I think you'll have a living just, just, just making these outlandish statements and, you know, all this self-aggrandizement and then getting humbled again and again and again, and it'll never get old because people fucking hate the guy. So well, I think that he has a future in boxing well beyond five years. And honestly, let's be honest with this, he's not, he's not a horrible fighter. Uh, he may be a horrible human being, but he's not a horrible fighter. 
And, uh, you know, I mean, whenever you have a fight with him, I mean, you know it's going to be, you know, you know you have, like, some interesting, like, quotes, you know, in the pre-fight hype. Um, you know, Broner's actually, I think, for all the hate that he gets, I actually think he's good for the sport. Uh, and he gets a lot of casuals to tune in if, if for no other reason other than the entertainment factor. Uh, and, um, you know, he's got a future. It's possible, actually, that he could end up in prison combing someone's fucking pubic hair. <laughs> It, you know? <laughs> I like watching his fights, to be honest. I know he's an arsehole, but I don't mind watching his fights. Own up. Own up. How many times have you watched the Maidana fight? <laughs> a good few times. A good few oh, times, man. yeah. I can't stand watching him. Honestly, I think he's so sloppy. Diet Floyd. You should call him Diet Floyd. Uh, I've, I've, I saw a photo of him the other day and he looked pretty fat, so I think he's going to be like a really shit version of James Tony. Oh, I if I can make a, a, a comment for a comment of the year, uh, I, or one-liner of the year, I thought Steve Wellings, when he said it, he said, Broner was wearing the I Can't Breathe shirt, and he goes, that's probably because it's too tight, he's so fat. Oh. <laughs> oh, I thought I had the best comment, actually. If you looked up the word eugenic in the dictionary, you see a picture of fucking Broner there. <laughs> I like that one. I, I just think it, I think he's in five years his gold teeth will be removed his gold chains will be off he'll be back at his crack den with his mum nice he's coming back to power like <laughs> his ten his ten kids will be around him you know and he'll probably just be fat as fuck like his dad and just you know eating his hot dogs right. and just in his vest that's not a brush his hair pops <laughs> hey who else we got uh, Matthew Tarragon is asking uh, I've heard a few of the guys say Floyd Mayweather has hand picked his fights, which I understand. What I would like to know is, if that is the case, what fighters has he ducked? Apart from the obvious, just to be clear, I'm not a lover of him, I'm just genuinely intrigued to know who he has ducked. When he was back down at Super Featherweight, I'm not saying he ducked all the title holders, but I would have liked to have seen him fight the likes of Spadafora, Freitas and Casamayor, who are all fellow title holders. I I think Casamayor avoided it. Did he? I think so, yeah. I would have loved to see that fight. Some folks say it was the other way around about, actually, that Mayweather ducked Casamayor. Strange, because Casamayor sort of fought everybody, really, didn't he? Well, I mean, yeah. within reason, like. Uh, I personally think you could say, I mean, yeah, people are going to say, oh, but the business aspect. But how about when Tim Bradley beat Manny Pacquiao? I mean, you could dispute it. Uh, many people do. I do. But, I mean, at the end of the day, you got to look at this at welterweight right right now in the the past three years. There's been three guys that have stood out among the rest: Floyd Mayweather, Manny Pacquiao, and Tim Bradley. Floyd Mayweather's fought neither of those two guys in three years. Huh? You say in the last three years? Well, last four years, whatever you want Marquez, to say. I mean, Marquez, Marquez. We fought Marquez, beat him. Yeah, I mean, okay, he did, but I mean, you have to. I mean, and I do believe that he would have beat him no matter what. But that weight stuff does, I mean, drag down on that. I mean, you know, he oh, pulled yeah. the guy up, fucking, what was it? Two divisions. Two, two fucking divisions, and then he doesn't make weight. I mean, and then he won't even weigh in on the fucking fight night scale because he knows that the weight disparity is going to be so large that people are going to discredit the win. I, I don't think it was that large, was it? I don't think it was. On the night, I don't think it was. I think Mayweather probably only comes in about yeah, 150. because fucking Marquez was drinking piss and ate himself up to the weight. Wow, like, now he's just taking loads of human growth hormone instead. Well, <laughs> shit, at least that would have been more competitive. Like, I Yeah, mean, I agree, I agree. Okay. Look, I, mean, I ain't no fucking Floyd fan. Don't worry about that, mate. I ain't, no, I ain't a Floyd apologist or anything. Don't get me no, wrong. And, I, and I'm not either, but I'm just saying, like, you know, I mean, all right, he, all right you know, I should have thrown Marquez in that mix. I apologize, but... All right, no so he has be- he has bar- he has beaten Marquez. That you know, fair play to him. And honestly, it didn't matter what the fuck Marquez Wade Floyd was going to beat him anyways. But I mean, it just it does take some of the shine off of that win. Uh, just Definitely. because of, you know the way that he approached the fight uh, and the you know, the idea. Well, I could just buy myself uh, extra things. But I mean, the other, the other thing I would say is, is that you know um, there was a time when he said, and then you know Fuego is like really passionate about the fact that Floyd didn't duck Cotto. But there was a time when someone asked him about Cotto, and he said, Cotto lives too far away. Uh, that Puerto Rico and, and and Las Vegas just did not mix. There was no way that that fight could happen. So it seems like, at the very least, you could say there was mutual disinterest on the on the part of both Floyd and Cotto, and that maybe they weren't interested in each other. Uh, there is, of course, the Costa Zoo 
fight. Uh, there's the um, you know, he, he didn't take uh-huh. he didn't take Hatton at his best weight. He pulled him up. Uh, he he drained Canelo down. I mean, that's the thing about Floyd Mayweather and, and the, the genius and the way. And Ellerby used to boast about this. He said that you know that that basically Floyd made the science behind Floyd Mayweather's undefeated record was that it wasn't just great, um, you know, great a great fighter, but it was also uh, great matchmaking or something something to that effect. But essentially, you know, he, he's always had a, a legitimate or semi legitimate excuse for not fighting certain guys. And when he has fought him, he's fought him when they're a little bit faded, or he's fought him, you know, at, at a weight that they're not comfortable at, or whatever. And it's hard to argue about it, you know, especially with somebody who's like a big fan of his. They'll be like, "Oh, well, you're just hating on him, or whatever." But I mean, at the end of the day, he's, I mean, the intelligence, the intelligent design behind the the, the guys that he has chosen to fight, and when he's fought them, and the weights he's fought them at, it's always been, it's like, it's like a chess game. And he always seems to be thinking way ahead of these all these other guys. So I mean, you know, I mean, I you could go on. I, mean, I could name more people. You know, people would say he ducked Margarito. I mean, that's to me kind of ridiculous, but because uh, I think he smashes him anyways. But it doesn't really matter. The point is, there's a lot Ooh, of guys. Tommy's that, not here to hear that. Oh, yeah, that would have been awesome. fight, I been all fight, man. Yeah, you know, I mean, whenever the fuck you wanted Floyd to fight somebody, he has a fought. The only thing I can think of in the past several years, is like what fight has Floyd Camilo. fought? Where it's like, oh, he fought the guy I wanted him to fight, and the only Canelo. fight I can think of is I couldn't give a shit about the Canelo fight. I was not in. Oh, I'll tell you what, call me a cynic, but I was not excited about the Canelo fight at all. For me, Canelo was still relatively unproven, and the one brilliant, well, well, not brilliant. I'll take that back. The one real, real world class fighter he fought pushed him really, really close. For me, Canelo was always tailor made for Floyd, yeah. and he dragged him down to yeah. what one fifty to his skeleton. Uh-huh. Yeah. 52. I mean, I see them. I see them. On, on, I listened to it back actually a couple of months back. I listened to the the pod when that fight was announced. I did say that Floyd was going to beat him easily, but remember Tommy saying that it was going to be the biggest grossing fight uh, probably in history at that point. I mean, it turned out to be true. Actually, I mean, I didn't get it at that time. It was either if he wasn't going to fight fighter B, then I think in all honesty, if he wasn't going to fight Golovkin, Martinez, um, the, the other name on 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 the list was. Was it Lara? I think. I think the other one after that was going to be Khan, and then you had Canelo was on that list, and I think he eventually ended up stepping up, taking that fight. But uh, next question, I'm going to leave this next question for Matchmaker until we get a Seif back on. Cause we know, Kurt, we need to get in touch with our Seif about our wee idea, so I'm going to put that question to him for next week. But this one comes in from Rocco. Uh, open it up to everyone. Did Paul Williams have the attribute or style to beat Floyd Mayweather? Give him a real hard fight, I think. Switch William- hitter, length. Well, no, Williams was primarily a southpaw. I think the issue with Williams was that he was terrible against other southpaws. He, he didn't, he couldn't get the angle on other southpaws. If you notice, every southpaw he fought, apart from the Quintana rematch, he looked diabolical. He, he had pretty slow feet, but he had an iron chin. Apart from Martinez, let's be honest, maybe we're going to hit him with a, fight, with a punch like that. I think Williams, you know, he doesn't really have great angles or anything. He's just really, really awkward, and he had a real high engine. It would have been one of them fights where Williams landed, like, 20 scuffing pun- punches around, and Mayweather would have landed five or six really clean punches, and we'd probably still be debating about what the what the result should have been now. Do you know what I mean? It would have been one of them type of fights. But I think Williams would have been a really hard fight for Mayweather, actually. Yeah, I agree with you, Kyle. I think that's exactly the way the fight would have gone. His size and his punch output would have made it awkward, but then they would have been saying, well, how many did he actually land? And like you say, Mayweather's speed would have been coming up through the middle and landing the odd shot here and there. And it would he would have given him a good fight, though, Williams. I think I don't think Mayweather would have fought him. I think he would fight him now, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, bro, no, bro. Can, can, can we get rid of that comment? <laughs> <laughs> Take it out of the final edit, Kurt, please. <laughs> God. Right, final question comes from Marcus Bellinger. Uh, how far can uh, Nayo and you go up in weight and still be successful? And would Rigo go to Rock Nation be a good move? I think Inu can go as far as Super Bantam weight, 122 pounds. And I think the move for Rigo to Rock Nation would be a good move for him personally because it would get him back on American television and B, would probably get him decent money as well. So that's my input on those two questions. Anybody else want to add to that? Does Rigo need any more promoters or managers or advisors? Yeah, or I know what a carry on it is, eh? Is it, get, is it 
Caribe or Caribe, Caribe promotions. Uh, Gary think, Hyde's not going anywhere. This Caribe crowd as well. I think there was someone else milling around at the time. Uh, I actually heard that if there was one person milling around saying they wanted something like 50% of Rigo and stuff like that, while Caribe Possibly. takes like 25%. I mean, what the fuck, man? Talk about, you know, the poor cunt gets human trafficked out the country and now he's getting made to fight for slave labour. Fuck's sake, what is this it's, Sam it, Langford all over again? It, it, it seems guys like Rigo, they got their advisors have got advisors who've got advisors and he just, you know, you wonder how much money he actually makes because he's just got so many people around him but if he can get someone like, you know, Rock Nation and he can get on American TV then I think that's best for, for him and the fans to be honest, that's what we need to see. Just all these guys in there trying to take a paycheck in it, I mean... Rigo, whatever's good for him to get on telly, whatever's good to get his name out there. And I think Jay-Z is the name on sort of everyone's lips at the moment. So, And since he signed Andre Ward, we expected a lot of things to happen with him and Rigo joining along as well. We might see some cards with those two uh, headlining it, which will probably, yeah, disappoint, a lot, probably disappoint a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love that. Oh, I must be a freak. I'd love that. Two no, I, I would medalists. enjoy it. I think, I think uh, you know, a slot would probably enjoy that a lot more than the... Uh, a more casual audience or the people that you know really can't stand those sorts of boxes basically but, um, you need to get Rigo in a Jay-Z video where he flashes his little gold tooth he dresses like a pimp and then you just put <laughs> at, at the end hashtag Rigo every, um, put JT with Justin Timberlake with his arm around him and that maybe have Beyonce grinding against him and Nicki Minaj giving him a lap dance and then I think <laughs> all the casuals go crazy and go Rigo and Doe's a pimp can't wait to see him on uh, you know, HBO this weekend or so and you, Jay-Z's going to market the shit out of these boys now I reckon I don't think Andre Ward will enjoy any of that stuff though he's got a, you know, a good SOG persona to keep up but I think Rigo would be well down for that kind of shit <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think that's that. The final that was the final question. Now, as I say, the Billy the Week Award is getting vacated this week because uh, we're saying we're running at almost one hour forty five minutes. Uh, we'll leave the fights we need to see in twenty fifteen till next week. So I think we've only got the one fight to discuss and the Andre Ward news as well. So that brings us on to the fight schedule, and then we'll discuss our in depth discussion for the big fight next week. But Kyle, mate, before we do, give me a breakdown or your take on the big fight from Japan, which I believe is next Saturday from Tokyo. Now, you've met the guy, John Thong Chuwatna faces Dake Kaneko for the OPBF Super Featherweight title. Can you give us any insight into these fighters? Uh, indeed, I can. Uh, John Thong Chuwatna is a really nice lad, actually. I saw him fight uh, last time I was out in Bangkok. He fought a real tough uh, Filipino, sort of good level journeyman, really, uh, Ronald Padilla, so who's quite, quite a tough little lad. And um, Chuatna was a devastating puncher in Muay Thai. Um, I think I said earlier that, you know, if if the ties are built up, built up, built up, it's, it's, it's probably because they're not got a Thai boxing, you know, kickboxing background. Uh, Jom Tong has, he, he had many different titles, and even though Muay, uh, Muay Thai, they don't really score punches as much, he was known as sort of a devastating puncher, really. Um, he hasn't really knocked out too many people in boxing. He start he started off quite well, knocked out a couple of durable guys, uh, or durable journeyman types. Uh, Kaneko, I, f- I think I remember him fighting Uchiyama a while back. He's a pretty good fighter actually. Uh, a really be a, a good test for Jom Tong. Jom Tong lately he hasn't been taking on many hard fights. He come back to Muay Thai last year and got pasted by one of the best fighters in the sport. Um, and since then, he's been taking on sort of international squash, squash matches where he'll go to Japan and he'll fight an international like sort of kickbox so he hasn't got a chance against him and he'll just smash him up. Um, so I think he's probably a bit rusty, to be honest with you. His big window to jump up the rankings really quickly was probably two years ago. I don't think he's looked anywhere near as good since, to be honest with you. And I've, I've, followed, I've made some on Facebook and that, and he doesn't seem in the... I don't think he's in the kind of shape where he'll be cutting a hunt to... 130 pounds quite easily to be perfectly honest with you uh, he, he doesn't look I don't know he doesn't look as focused as he was uh, but in terms of his actual style he's quite a plodding fighter good pressure fighter real solid backhand he's southpaw real solid backhand and um, good body puncher as I say he's pretty tough in his last fight over in Japan he got dropped really briefly in more of a flash knockdown more than anything else but um, he's got iron chin and it, it'll make for a good fight for sure I think we'll actually get to see this fight somehow. Uh, no. It's about your shame, man. The only reason the Padillas fight happened was because my mate filmed it from ringside, so... Alright. 
Yeah, you can that one, mate. I can send that one to me at some point. Uh, wish, I'll have a look to see if I still got it. Unfortunately, my mate's channel got taken down because he had all these rare Muay Thai fights on there and he got uh, sued, which is mental because it's been on there for years. I probably saved it, though. It's got me nattering all the way through it. There's still highlights of it on... um Because the TV only showed two rounds of it. They didn't show anything else, but we had the full fight. So the only reason the full fight's out there is because we filmed it. But, um... Yeah, it's, I'll, I'll see if I've still got it. There's a few fights of his, mate. I'll send them over to you. There's a few fights of his. I've got a few of his Muay Thai knockouts where you can see how hard he hits. You know what I mean? He's, he's a good fighter. I, I'll, I reckon he'd take Uchiyama. Uchiyama looks shot. I reckon uh, yeah. uh, Chiwatana would knock him out, to be honest with you. Interesting. No, I think, Kurt, you dived away, mate. Are you back? Kurt. Nah. Not back yet. Anyways, the big fight, I mean, uh, well, before we go into the big fight, actually, Leo Santa Cruz against Jesus Ruiz. Who? Exactly. Who? Who the fuck is this guy? You don't know Jesus Ruiz? Are you joking? Who's he for? I'm trying to remember. Oh, I don't oh, know I, him either, mate. I've never heard of him. The fucking guy, I tell you, the only name I recognise on his record is Andres Gutierrez. It's the only one I fucking know. Nine round draw. That's because Ruiz is one of the most avoided fighters in the whole of boxing, mate. I don't know how you don't know this. This guy is an animal, mate. <laughs> there oh, are people... Oh, he's them. Oh, he's a devastator, mate. He's, he's the hardest cab driver in his road. Hey, 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 listen to this. I'm looking at his, fa- his box rate page just now. Now, I don't want to sound like box rate Brandon, right, but his reach, right? I don't know. His reach has come up as, <laughs> as half a centimetre. Sorry, half inch or one centimetre. Half you know, inch. I'll I've post it up on the next one. Maybe, co- maybe that's his cock size. <laughs> he's 25 <laughs> and he's had 43 fights. Yeah, they breed them rough Mexican over there. Mexican, rough, rough early starter. Half an inch reach. <laughs> <laughs> one centimetre reach. He must have got little dinosaur arms. Uh, John Conti. He's nails, mate, this guy. You're going to see it. I bet, uh, finally, if he knocks Santa Cruz out, it'd be fucking hilarious, wouldn't it? Oh, what? I bet he throws him in one justice. Round. What if it just up all the shit that's went down? Nah, he's shit, mate. He's shit. I bet he turns up with man boobs. Yep. If, if Steve Cruz uh, this uh, side, I'll be slightly disappointed. I reckon he's got a mullet. <laughs> I'm having a look. No, I reckon he's got one of those rat's tails where it's sort of shaved at the back. Oh, oh yeah, about, the old, yeah. Talking about rat's... That's the rats, Indians, that is. Talking about <laughs> rat's tails, actually. There's one person who's, who's, who has got a, a ponytail that looks like an anaconda. The main event, Bermain Stavern puts up his WBC heavyweight title against De- Deontay Wilder, Kurt. Um, first off, mate, that fucking ponytail needs to get sliced off. He must be carrying that as a half hundred weight in weight there. I mean, fuck's sake. Fucking well, well, yeah, that. You, you start to wonder how much does Stavern really weigh because that weighs an absolute ton by the looks of it. I mean, can you imagine that being dipped in chip fat? Or what? A bit fucking two stone in weight. <laughs> But anyways, mate, you know, you're, you're a resident heavyweight expert in the absence of, of a, a thief, but uh, to me, I'm, I'm going with Stever, mate, obviously, because I think I mean, there's no real a great, right, there's no like, kind of great difference between, between the resumes and all this, although Stavern's got the RLO victories and the, maybe the Ray Austin one, uh, you maybe say the, maybe the, the, the Manswell win as well. I think he's maybe you know, slightly more proven. Um, I can see Stavern at one point sit on the ropes if some people are saying it's not going to help it's not going to work but I think I can see Wilder walking into something he's going to be way wide with his punches and I can see Stavern catch my left hook at some point so I'm going with Stavern what do you think? Yeah I mean Stavern he hasn't got quick feet he's pretty stationary but when he ha- and he's pretty inactive but when he actually lets his hands go he's pretty explosive and quick and it's going to be interesting to see how he you know he, how he goes about this fight because if he lies on the ropes like he did against uh, Areola, he could get caught with obviously something big because of the you know the reach advantage of the size of Wilder. But if he tries to force the action, it's not it's, it's hard to see him doing that because like I said, he's not really that type of fighter. And I've got to go with him as well because of what he did to Areola. I mean, Wilder just hasn't been in with a, a legit test of any kind. I mean, he, his biggest test was Malik Scott, who was never. There was never any fear there of what was coming back. Malik Scott's a boxer, but he can't punch at all. And with Stavern, this is the first guy you could obviously know that Wilder can't make the same mistakes he's made before because of what could come back. And I'm going to take him. I mean, he, like Wilder, he came to boxing late, but he's he's been boxing for like since the late 90s now. Wilder's still a, a novice compared to him. And, you know, in the amateurs, it's a different game, but he had success against guys like Hellenius and David Price, much bigger guys than him. And I just think, you know... This when we find out the truth about Deontay Wilder, I mean, I don't think he takes a shot well, and 
It's not going to go off six rounds, I can't see. And I, I just do think Sivan's going to hurt him and stop him. Anybody else want to pick Wilder? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to pick Wilder. I don't rate Wilder, and I think his chin is probably terrible, man. But he looks terrible. But I've got a feeling that even though he does fall in quite a lot and he's quite sloppy with his sort of overhand punches and that, Stefan, he, he loves to sit on the ropes and pot shot. He don't really, well, he don't really pot shot. He just waits for the perfect counters. He isn't really. I think if he were to come forward and just punch Wilder, I think the kid would fall to bits. But I think Wilder is going to. I think he's just going to smash Devern on the ropes. <coughs> I don't really think we can even prove that his power is legit yet, like at the world world level, even though he clearly has got heavy hands. But Stavern, for me, I just think even Ariola had him in trouble at some times on the ropes, and then he sort of come back, rolled with it, and hit him. <coughs> as much as I hate to say it, I think Wilder's going to knock Stavern out. <coughs> Excuse me. I, I agree. You going yeah. with Wilder, Donny? Yeah, um, the thing is, is that waiting against Deontay Wilder um, at mid-range is a bad idea. Uh, and I don't think Stiverne is going to come forward and pressure the way he should, the way Kyle just said that he should. Uh, that's the way that, um, you yeah, know, that would, that would be best for him, but he's not going to do that. Anybody else pick Wilder? Steve, Alex? No. I, well, I'm on the fence a little bit about this one, actually. I think Wilder will hurt Stavern, but I think Stavern will come back and possibly stop him. I don't think it's going to go too long, maybe three or four rounds. We know that Wilder can dish it out, but we're not sure how well he can take it in return. He's, you know, His opposition level has been pretty poor, and there's all these rumours about you know, him getting rocked in sparring, and he's been rocked in early in his career and all this type of stuff. But you know, these are heavyweights at the end of the day, and you can't sort of go in swimming pool without getting wet, so we don't really know how bad... Wilder's chin is, but talking about records, I was having a look at Stiverne's record actually earlier. I mean, Stiverne's record is pretty sketchy, both for opposition levels and for inactivity. If, you, if I know he was under contract with Don King, and that might account for a lot of his inactivity, but he had one fight in 2010, which was a first round knockout against a journeyman, two fights in 2011, which were both decent wins against Manswell and Ray Austin, one fight in 2012 against Willie Herring. One fight in 2013 against Ariola, and one fight in 2014. I mean, you know, he's been really very inactive. I'm not saying that's going to stand to him in the fight. It's going to affect him or anything. But I mean, I was really shocked at how you know this is talking fighting for a world title here, and um, there's lots of trash talk involved. But on paper, it's a good fight, and I like Stiverne's style because he sets these nice traps for opponents. He lies on the ropes and. He reminds me of, I said this before, the old former US Olympian Lawrence Claybay. He doesn't look, look like he's in the best condition, but he, when he lets his hands go, he's got nice speed and accuracy. And Wilder will be throwing wild shots, so I can see Wilder hurting Stavern, but Stavern stopping Wilder. It's a hard fight to pick, mainly because we don't know much about either of these guys, really. I mean, Stavern was stopped earlier, but I've, um, earlier on in his career, but I have seen it. It was a kind of one where. He was covering up and you know taking shots around the arms, but it wasn't really. You could see why a referee at a low level would stop it, but I don't think you could really say, "Oh, he's got a you know a shoddy chin because of it." But at the same time, you know, Donnie and myself seem to agree. You know, he just sort of sits there and waits, and Wilder will thrive on that because what you got to do with Wilder is show him you're not scared because then he, his legs seem to turn to jelly, and you know he just doesn't seem to like it. He is a bully in the ring. I don't think he's a bad guy or anything, but I think he's a bit of a bully in the ring. And Stavern's not. He's going to sit there and Wilder's going to go, I'm in my element here, swing one of them mad overhand shots on him and probably clip him. But at the same time, you know, what if Stavern ain't got the longest reach? What if he can get inside one of them? What if he wants him to think that he can throw one of them big shots just to slip inside it and throw one of his looping shots? He throws a nice left hook to some Stavern and I don't know, it really is. I think it's a bit of a they're not brilliant heavyweights, but I think it's a bit of a classic heavyweight tussle, to be honest with you. It's got a lot of the feeling of, like, you know, sort of, if not Ali and Frazier, then maybe, you know, uh, maybe if you put, like, Shavers versus Norton, you know what I mean? That was a one-round blowout, that sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? Neither of them are great heavyweights, these two. They're not even on that level uh, so far, anyway. It's got that sort of thing where you don't really know what's going to happen, do you know what I mean? And you know someone's going to get put out at some point, and that's what we want from heavyweights, really. I can't complain about the fight. Yeah, who who does who does I mean. everybody think should 
would be the best winner in terms of the future Stivone, of the heavyweight Stivone, division. Because Al Heyman is not going to let Wilder fight Klitschko. Klitschko. Yeah, I agree with that. I yeah. think the best thing to happen is going to be Stavern win because that title, if, if Wilder wins it, will be held to ransom. He'll fucking fight Butterbean. He will probably dig up the corpse of Joe Frazier to fight him. I, stuff like that. I don't... <laughs> I'm not joking, Spilker man. Well, that's, well, that's, that's, that's what Heyman will pull this shit, I'm telling you. He signed Spilker as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, Heyman. look, look. He'll, he'll, he'll hold the belt for a little while. He'll milk the title and he'll have a few... You know, fights against guys he'll easily beat. But I will say this: if his chin is as bad as some people suggest that it might be, and given that you know the 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 big payday that would result from having Wilder fight Vlad, I think that Heyman might let him milk the title for a while. But he's not going to put him in against anybody legit for a couple fights. And but then eventually, though. When people complain a little bit and they're not going to want to see him fight like you know stiffs anymore, you know he's going to have to put him in with Vlad because you don't want to put him in with somebody like semi legit if his chin is bad because he might get knocked out and then all that Vladimir Klitschko money goes right down the toilet. And I think that if it, it Wilder has any say over his own career, he's going to want the Vlad fight sooner or later as well because of the fact that it provides him with so much money and he's going to be eager to take it. So basically, he has got you know, no say on his own career. Al Heyman's got to prove that. You see, we see, see them when the fucking after the fight and stuff. Oh, I need to sit down with my advisor, Al Heyman, and think about the next fight. I like to thank God, Jesus Christ, my savior, all that sort of stuff. I thank Al Heyman and all that sort of stuff. My sponsors, Nike, Reebok, Adidas, fucking Gola, Puma, all that sort of shit. <laughs> Holy you know, like, you say Gola? No, Puma. Gola. <laughs> Gola. Isn't um, Povetkin the, the WBC mandatory for the winner of this fight oh, if Brian Jennings him. takes on Klitschko? Ah, but Jennings might not take on Klitschko. I think Shannon Briggs Let's is going to take on Klitschko. Let's go, champ. I thought it was close to agreed. Like, yeah, but because it was agreed with Gary Shaw, but now Rock Nation have taken over his fighters. Now they're... They're trying to want oh, to change gonna, the no, no, I reckon they're going to want that because Jay Z's got like stakes in the Barclays Centre anyway, and he and that's where Vlad was supposed to be fighting next anyway. Yeah. Shannon, the cannons coming in on that one, I think. Black Sagal. I wonder if the Black Sagal will get his ringside passes for that one, making maybe, maybe video <laughs> his moment in the glory. You know. I tell you and what, they don't want to call purse bids for Povetkin and Wilder because Al Heyman might be Al Heyman, but he's never going to outbid uh-huh. that Russian fella. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what though, if if, uh, if the WBC uh, is going to go on with this thing, didn't they say that the uh, winner of Kovalev versus Pascal is going to be the mandatory to Stevenson? Yeah. 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 Well, wouldn't it be interesting? We all know that uh, that Vlad obviously is uh, a friend of the sanctioning bodies. They all like him. He defends all of their titles. He pays them all of their sanctioning fees. And uh, and I think I heard a rumor somewhere that saying that if uh, Wilder wins, that at some point they basically might make uh, Vlad the mandatory to the title. Uh, Mauricio Suleiman seems to be keen on trying to make some good fights. I don't know if his uh, you know, if he's if that's just lip service and if he's just talking or no, not. No, it's true. But, we spoke to him. What was his name? Jamie. What was his name again? Kurt, Jamie. Jamie. What was his surname? He, 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 he does the... the Paris? Was it Paris? Jamie Paris. Yeah. UK Paris. rep for WBC. He, it was an opinion as he is trying to force the big fights. He wants the big fights to happen. It's a good step in the right direction and trying to get VADA, the drug testing protocol on board. That's a good move, in my personal opinion. But uh, this, this move means that they've made... They've made fighter B the mandatory for fighter A, but why no why no force the fight? And then obviously they've got Kovalev Stevenson and you've also got uh, what was it, Golovkin against Golovkin and Cotter, yeah. Cotter and Canelo. So, you know, I think they're making the right move because they've had meetings with the IBF and the WBA. They want to get one universally recognised world champion because this, stag- this stagnation of fucking or proliferation of titles, sorry, it's just no good for the sport. So I think uh, WBC seems to be trying to kind of right the wrongs of the past. It's only a good move. Yeah, Klitschko will take that straight off Wilder, won't he? That'll be a Michael Grant being fed to Lennox Lewis. One yeah, I, reckon he, I reckon he's worse than Michael Grant. Michael Grant is so? much better than me. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Michael Grant probably didn't hit quite as hard as him, but at the same time, I, don't, I reckon if Galotta had... Uh, uh, Wilder down, he wouldn't get up from that. At least Grant had some heart. He wasn't yeah, he that showed, good, but he showed he balls, didn't he, Grant? Like he got. Yeah, up he did have bollocks, yeah. man. You know, it's only Lewis that ruined him, and Lewis would have probably knocked out Wilder with a fart, mate, at the weigh-in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing is, though, I mean, Donny, we just assume that that one 
because of that one fight or because he's been matched soft or both because outside of that, uh, Kurt knows his name, but outside of that one fight, he hasn't really shown evidence of being hurt unless my memory is yeah. mistaken. He got, he, got stopped at cru- he, got sto- he got stopped at heavyweight by a cruiserweight uh, in the amateurs and he got buzzed by some fat club fighter cruiserweight who looked like, made John McDermott look like uh, Adonis yeah. Stevenson. <laughs> and right. there's other heavyweight that... Uh, didn't, didn't, right didn't, Kovalev get, didn't Kovalev get sparked in the amateurs too? I mean, like... Yeah, yeah, true, but he wasn't getting hurt by fat, you know, middleweights, was he? Darnell but, Boone's a devastating puncher, mate, you know what I mean? And he couldn't finish Kovalev off. David Hay had fucking Wilder on stilts, shaky stilts and sparring, with 16-ounce yeah, well, gloves and head guard on. That's <laughs> David Hay, though. The thing is, if Wilder has got a bad chin, I mean, it's not going to do him well with them bambi legs. I mean, he's got ridiculously skinny <laughs> legs for a man of his legs, size. Yeah. So if, if he is get hurt by Stavern, you know, he could re- literally be Bambi on ice, that's the thing. I think going, Vlad would yeah. just destroy him, man. Oh, v- v- Vlad, okay. Vlad would ice him, Vlad vaporises him, he ex- ex- expends him, he expunges, he terminates, he fucking wipes him out. And Jennings, Vlad wipes out Jennings too if that fight gets made, I think. Yeah, I don't, I don't see Jennings well, offering just, much, to be honest. I prefer to see Jennings Wilder, really. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. that'd be a good one. But uh, uh, to be honest, I'm actually, I'm actually quite impressed that Povetkin's got himself back into the mix, actually, because it, it could have been quite easy for him to kind of fall away after that clutch school performance. I think he looks better than ever. Not yeah. Knockout, yeah. Carlos Takam was incredible. Takam's no joke, mate. Yeah, he's gone the right way, hasn't he, Povetkin? He hasn't gone the friggin' Shannon Biggs chasing around the world. He's gone and beaten the or, contenders. He's or got Deontay his way. Wilder route, you know. Yeah. How, how the fuck he got WBC number one off that resume? I have no idea. But I'll tell you one thing, actually. With his defence, I, I really do believe that if Stavern can just maybe bide his time and find that opening, I think he can whip in the left hook and he's going to fucking take him out. Well, it's, been, it's going to be interesting to see how he actually reacts if he can actually hit. Solidly, because this is this is the, this is what we're all asking about Anthony Joshua. You know, when he takes up, steps up in, in in class and faces someone, he's going to get chinned. He's going to get chinned. Well, he seems more solid than Wilder, I think. I don't know why he just does that. I don't know. He seems a bit more. I tell you one he's thing. Tired. Josh, he's just tired. Yeah. I, I think one thing about Joshua, I saw it in the World Amateur Final against that. Uh, Mesut of I saw a guy there. Once he, if he's hurt, he is going to go to war, and he's got a fighter's heart about him. So oh, that's definitely. One thing, yeah. That's one thing we know about about Joshua. He will go into the trenches if needs be. We know jack shit about about Deontay Wilder. Thirty-two fights, thirty-two knockouts. I mean, this guy isn't Edwin Valero, for instance, but he's fought no one. So I think next week's going to prove it, where he's at. It, it'll be good for him as well if he does win. You know, if he does go a few rounds, we just see a bit more. You know. Resilience from these opponent, you know. If we see another first right hand throw and Severn's gone, it's still the same story. Yeah, it's great what he's done, but we still don't know anything about him. The thing is about I Wilder. I, I said probably about last year or, or year before when Wilder was, you know, really coming onto the scene. I said this guy will never ever win a world title. And what's happened since is he's been manoeuvred through the rankings, you know, cleverly. All the promoters do it. And now he's got himself a world title shot. And he's fighting probably the one guy that he could beat because of the styles that they're matching up against. Stevan will lay against the ropes. If he, well, if he does, he's going to get sparked out, I think. I think that the way you beat Wilder is either you outbox him at completely long range and you tire him out and he chases you for ages and he's gone because his tiny little legs and his massive little upper body his massive upper body you just get fucking exhausted and then you just bang him out after like the fifth or sixth round or you get in close you rough him up you bully him and you tell him that you're the boss and then you spark him out but staying at mid-range as we've said or against the ropes waiting for him to hit you is the wrong move, and I think that he's been manoeuvred p- absolutely perfectly by by Heyman, and he could win a world title from this. And it's a joke, and it it really sums up the problems that are in boxing today. That this man, who I still think is completely overrated, he's got yeah, he's got you know the power of God in his right hand, but he's shit. He's just unbelievably you know well, chinny. You don't, and you don't you don't like his textbook boxing skills. <laughs> I love I love that Floyd Mayweather type defence that he's got moving back in straight lines while open guard and all that sort of stuff. You know? <laughs> I mean, Amazing. that fight, that, that that last fight he took against you from a sparring partner. What was his name again? No who's idea. That, who's that guy? He fucking they fought like Ko. You fought like Kovic not long ago, didn't he? Yeah, he Nikolai Firth at one point, didn't he? Yeah, he didn't he fight on the Cal Brook poor undercard again? Yep. Was, 
Firtha was the one who had a guy with decent. Guy. That's the one. Yeah. That's, that's the one I'm talking about. Uh, Jason Gavin Green, wasn't it? He's ex- yeah. he's Jason Gavin. Yeah. That yep. went four rounds, right? That's where they got. It was so shit. I mean, oh, okay, guys, we're being negative here. We need to get a wee bit more positivity here, but. It was shit because how he carried that guy for four. He could have, he dropped him and like I think he dropped him in the third and fourth. He could have ended that fight in the second round because Gavin spent his fucking load in the first. Don't know how he never took him out earlier. It's a joke, mate. I, I think further for what was the right the the way he fought Wilder was what we need to right. see from more opponents. He he put well, him under pressure. He got dropped, but he he went for it to try and win. He was trying to you know hurt Wilder. He wasn't just standing there waiting to get knocked out and. You know, Furfer did the same kind of thing to Fury. He gave him a good fight. So they're the type of guys you would like to see him against. But mm-hmm. right now, it's a shame that he's he's fighting for a world title, the heavyweight title, and we don't know much about him. That Calvin Price was quite big, though. But I think he's just an undefeated sort of club fighter, and I think he just got destroyed as well. He has beaten the legendary Kurtz and Manswell, who against Stefan looked like probably one of the worst fighters I've ever seen in my entire life. Been in Does prize it, fighter. See sh- 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 when you hear that name. Yeah, it was, yeah. See when you hear his name. Do you actually ever think about a hard one? Curtin Manswell. Oh. Manswell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'd get a hard on, No. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, do you, do you ever think about you know, I, you know, think about a hard on or a right penis when you hear that name sometimes? Uh, yeah, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the conversation. Mate. That's the conversation. I'll never be able to watch him ever again. Now, am I? Do you know what I mean? Every time I see him, I'll be like, ooh, uh. <laughs> that's uh, I think that's the end of the discussion there guys but uh, I think to thank our listeners again for for tuning in or Twitter listeners sorry about the Bell of the Week and some of our discussions at the first show back we're running almost just, under, just over two hours there so next week we'll have the the fights that must happen in 2015 they will be reaching out to our C for a little heavyweight segment and we'll maybe get a couple of questions for them into there so any questions you want to ask them, get them into us. I'd like to thank the panel today. I'd like to thank Kyle McLaughlin, Kurt Ward, Steve Wellens, Donny Baseball and Alex Morris. I've been your host, Andy Patterson, and we'll see you next week. All the best. Gold Rush, Audley Harrison.